So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this year's Sites Development Day conference. So my name is Anders Olofsgård, and I'm a deputy director here at the Stockholm Institute of Transition Economics, or SITE, at the Stockholm School of Economics, and I'm also an associate professor at the school. And I will be the host for you today. So this is the 11th time now that we organize this yearly conference within the area of economic development and transition policy. Normally, of course, we meet here in real life at the Stockholm School of Economics, but unfortunately, the pandemic has made us run the event digitally also this year. Maybe in some sense not as engaging as we would wish if we were to be able to meet here in person, uh, but you know the topics and the discussions that we're going to talk about are equally important and relevant, and at least it does help to reduce the carbon footprint. So as some of you may know, in previous years, we have discussed topics such as aid effectiveness, the post-2015 development agenda, gender and development, and the state of democracy in Eastern Europe. And last year, we focused, sort of naturally, on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in that same region. This year, though, we keep focus on Eastern Europe, but we focus on a slightly different topic, but that also has enormous importance for our world looking forward, and that is constantly, I would say, in the central, national, and international policy discussions. And that's the topic of environmental policies with a particular focus on global warning, warming, energy transformation, and energy security. This is also an area in which SITE and our free network of research institutes in Eastern Europe will be even more active looking forward. So those of you who are interested in environmental policies in the context of Eastern Europe, you for sure have reasons to keep an eye out for future events and publications from us here at SITE and the free network. And as part of this effort, SITE has also recently hired an excellent expert in the field, Julius Andersson, who holds a PhD in environmental economics from London School of Economics. So Julius will kick off our program with a short introduction to the topic. But first, I just want to mention a few practical things. So the day will feature four different sections with lunch and coffee breaks in between. In each section, there will be some opportunities for questions from you, the audience. And for that, please use the Q&A function in the Zoom app. We will try to address as many questions as possible, but obviously we may not be able to have time for all questions we get. So please bear that in mind and be a little bit patient. Also, just to make sure in case you have missed it, Deputy Minister Janine Alm Eriksson, who was supposed to be on the program, will unfortunately not be able to participate since her party, the Green Party, resigned from the Swedish government two weeks ago. And I can assure you that site had nothing to do with that. To keep up with the standards of the day, we appreciate any help to reach out in social media. Use your Twitter accounts if you have one, and Facebook updates are of course also welcome. And please use the hashtag development day site when you tweet uppercase DD, uppercase site. We would greatly appreciate that. But with that, let me leave the floor to Julius, who will first give a short introduction to the topic and then lead the first session focusing on Russia. So, Julius, please. Thank you so much, Anders. Uh, welcome, everyone. So, uh, my name is Julius Anderson, and I joined SITE here a year and a half ago, and I'm an uh, environmental economist, and I do research specifically on climate change. So, before we jump into today's exciting topic and agenda on environmental policy in Eastern Europe, I was my plan is to give you just a quick eight minutes overview of uh, the issue of climate change and why it's such a challenge in the limiting global warming. Yes, can you see the screen? Almost soon. Okay, so climate change and the challenges of limiting <clears throat> global warming. So this will be rather quick. But, uh, so what is climate change? Well, the standard definition is that climate change is a change in the state of the climate identified by changes in the mean or the variability of its properties and that persists for an extended period, decades or longer. So we're talking of changes in the mean, but also changes in the variability, so more extreme weather, weather events and so on. And on the picture here to the right, you can see observed changes in <clears throat> global temperature. And uh, we can see these large spikes in the last uh, decades. So in 2020, the global average temperature was 1.1 degree over uh, the average uh, from 1850 to 1900. 
And we've known for a long time that there's a link between fossil fuel usage and climate change. And already in 1890, the Swedish scientist Svante Arrhenius uh, speculated that this was due to the burning of fossil fuels. So he linked uh, atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide to global warming. So we've known this for at least 130 years. And then Charles David Keeling in the 1960s, he provided estimates of this atmospheric CO2 levels, and he documented increases in these global concentrations known as the Keeling curve, which you can see down in, to the figure to the right. And these, uh, this picture here shows the different economic sectors uh, and the different greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change. So on the pie chart to the left, what we can say basically is that 75% uh, of all the sectors uh, that contribute to climate change or the release of greenhouse gases are due, uh, due to energy production or consumption. And the rest, 25% is agriculture. And then if we look at the different greenhouse gases, around 75% is carbon dioxide. And then the rest is methane uh, and nitrous oxide and fluorinated gases. So in, in essence, it's fossil fuels, uses of fossil fuels, burning uh, and emitting uh, carbon dioxide, but then we also have some methane and nitrous oxide from the agriculture sector. And then, okay, what is the challenge? Well, we want to limit warming to one and a half to two degrees of warming. And then this figure here comes from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This shows the challenge until 2050. So today we're emitting around 40 billion tons of CO2 every year globally. So that's 40 gigatons of CO2 every year. And if we want to limit uh, warming to uh, no more than one and a half degrees, around year 2050, we we'll already need to be at net zero. So you can see in this figure that this is a quite sharp decline, yearly decrease in emissions going forward. So what does this mean with the, in terms of a remaining carbon budget? Well, we have around 580 gigatons of CO2 left to burn if we want to have a 50-50 chance of staying below uh, one and a half degrees uh, warming. And from this figure here, we can see the, <clears throat> the remaining proved reserves uh, of coal, gas, and oil. And if we could would continue burning them at the current levels, we would have 132 years left of coal and around 50 years left. Uh, of gas and oil. And then the, the figure to the right, we can see here that the black um, horizontal line here is showing this is how many years we would have left of using these uh, fossil fuels if we want to limit uh, warming to one and a half degrees. We have 13 years left, but you can see that the, uh, the, the remaining reserves uh, would last us much longer than that and would lead to much more warming than one and a half degrees. And if we look across the globe at the largest oil producers, we can see that the United States, Russia, and Saudi Arabia are the three largest producers of oil. And then we also have Canada and Iraq, and, and from our neighbors here, also Norway is one of the largest producers. And if we look at natural gas, uh, again, United States and Russia are the two main uh, players here on the scene that uh, produces most of the natural gas globally. And then the question is, okay, how do we reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Well, the couple of things that we need to do, we need to reduce energy use and increase energy efficiency. We need to replace fossil fuels with low energy carbon sources, uh, sorry, low carbon energy sources, such as uh, solar and wind, uh, hydro or nuclear. So solar and wind are intermittent. Uh, the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. So we need to store the energy. So that's why we need energy storage battery. And connected to that, with batteries, we also need to electrific electrification of the transport sector. Uh, so that's our all uh, efforts uh, linked to the energy sector. But then if we want to combat uh, emissions from the agriculture sector, we also need to reduce deforestation and other means to lower emissions from agriculture. Okay, so the large question is then, so how do we do international cooperation around this question? How do we limit uh, emissions of greenhouse gases together? So the problem with uh, climate change, of course, is that it's a global problem, right? So it doesn't matter where you emit carbon dioxide, uh, it affects everyone the same. So it's a, a global uh, externality problem. But there's been some uh, efforts uh, on uh, global governance and international cooperation on climate change. Starting in 1992, the United Nations Framework on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, was adopted. And this has very wide membership. Uh, almost all countries on earth have signed this. 
And the objective of the UNFCCC is then to prevent dangerous human-caused climate change by stabilizing the stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And the first major breakthrough uh, came in 1997 when the Kyoto Protocol was signed at the third COP conference, at the Conference of the Parties. This is a conference uh, that happens almost every year. Uh, and the Kyoto Protocol then contained legally binding emission targets for all developed countries. But it was quite apparent after a while that the Kyoto Protocol was not enough. So the US never ratified the argument uh, of the agreement. Uh, there were no binding targets, for instance, for large emitters such as China and India. So uh, a new treaty was needed. In 2015, the Paris Agreement was reached. And in the Paris Agreement, uh, <clears throat> we set a, an even more ambitious global warming target of one and a half degree. And uh, an ambition to, uh, uh, to have global emissions to peak as soon as possible with rapid reductions thereafter. And within the Paris Agreement, each country uh, submit pledges called Nationally Determined Contributions, NDCs, towards this common target of limiting global warming. And these NDCs are then to be submitted at five-year intervals. And the target for Europe uh, is, the latest target is a 55% emission reduction by the year 2030, uh, relative to levels of emissions from 1990. So let's see what happened. So we had the last meeting now in November, the latest meeting, the COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, so what happened in this meeting? Well, uh, countries <coughs> updated their NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contribution. And we've, if we uh, estimate what that entails in form of uh, future warming, we are still on track for 2.4, 2.7 degrees of warming at the end of the century. So we're still not... Uh, at the one and a half or two degree target, but it's still an improvement because before Glasgow, the NDCs were pointed more towards an uh, increase of more than three degrees of warming. The other uh, large uh, thing that came out of uh, Glasgow was a pledge from many nations to reduce methane emissions, but at least 30% by the year 2030. So uh, one way to look at uh, the success of uh, the meeting in Glasgow is to see uh, what was the, the the reaction from the markets. So in this figure here is uh, looking at the price of uh, carbon permits in the EU ETS market. So in the EU, we have a large emission trading scheme where you need to have a, a permit if you're, for instance, a power, uh, if you have a coal power plant, for instance, you need to have permits for each uh, ton of CO2 you emit. And this is the price of uh, these permits in the EU market this year. And we can see here that starting from November, after the meeting, there was a quite large increase in the price from 60 euros per ton of CO2 to above 80. I know uh, uh, causation is not correlation, and there may be other forces here, but this is an indication that, that the market uh, reacted uh, to the uh, Glasgow meeting, thinking that we had more stringent, stringent targets in place. Okay, thank you. That was a very quick uh, uh, nine minutes overview of the topic of climate change. And uh, so after this short uh, introduction of the topic, uh, let's start with the exciting program of today's um, Site Development Day. And we are very happy to welcome our first speaker, Irina Pominova. So Irina is the head of uh, Climate and Green Energy Center for Strategic Research in Moscow. And uh, Irina will talk to us today about climate policy in Russia. But after Irina's presentation, we'll also have some commentary from Natalia Volchkova. And Natalia is the policy director at Safir and assistant professor at NES in Moscow. And we'll also get commentary from Jan Johansson. Jan Johansson, sorry. Uh, and Jan is senior program manager at SIDA here in Stockholm. And after their uh, individual presentations, we will open up the floor for Q&A. But again, welcome Irina. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today. Uh, and first of all, I would like to thank uh, our site for such an interesting event uh, and for this opportunity to make a presentation about current state and trends uh, of uh, Russian climate policy development. Uh, so the main idea is that um, it is actually an action time for climate policy in Russia. And that is what I will try uh, to uh, show. Uh, but before I will try to share my presentation with you, just a moment. 
Um, okay, I hope you can see the slides. So uh, I can move on. Uh, when we refer to climate policy, uh, it is necessary uh, to understand the current position in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and its trends. Uh, here I took as a basis our national inventory because there are different sources of information, but uh, Russia has an obligation uh, to um, annually disclosure uh, its uh, greenhouse gas emissions. It is under UNFCCC uh, and uh, it is made on the basis of official methodology and it is also verified uh, at the international level. So uh, since we have such a source, I prefer to use this source. Uh, the, uh, one of the most important thing about the dynamics of our greenhouse gas emissions is uh, a very sharp uh, decrease, um, which took place uh, in the beginning of 1990s. Uh, of course, it was uh, the result of um, transition period and uh, uh, it actually was um, paid by quite um, extensive uh, cost. It was um, one of the hardest periods in our modern history. Uh, but as we can, and um, till now they are more or less stable. Yes, there is a slight trend um, toward um, growth, but, um, well, more or less, we are trying to stabilize our emissions at the moment. Uh, if we compare uh, what are our current position uh, with uh, 1990, it is uh, minus 33%, if we exclude forestry, uh, and uh, it is almost 50% if we uh, will take into consideration our observation capacity. Uh, so we, uh, um, uh, on quite good position in comparison with 1990, but still much uh, has to be done in the future to, to sustain this position. Uh, as it was already mentioned, as a principal contribution, as in the other parts of the world, is made by energy sector. Uh, then it's about our industrial processes, agriculture, and uh, waste. Uh, so the structure is quite usual. Uh, again, as a main uh, gas, we have uh, CO2 uh, and the methane as well. Um, the methane's contribution to our balance of greenhouse gas emissions is also around 15%. Uh, also important thing about this picture is that um, uh, Russia uh, today ranks uh, fifth among the top world emitters after China, uh, United States, uh, the European Union as a whole, and after India. Uh, and uh, our total contribution to the total is around 5%. So I try different databases to be correct, but uh, well, sometimes less, sometimes more, but around 5%. This is uh, what we have for today. And of course, uh, being among uh, the largest emitters means that we have uh, high attention to our actions at the national level and that we uh, have to uh, make our contribution to the world uh, efforts of combating climate change. Uh, well, uh, since energy is uh, the largest uh, uh, sector, of uh, the larger source of greenhouse gas emissions. It is also important to show where we stand uh, in terms of energy balance and electricity balance as well. Uh, so you can see that currently our main source of energy is gas and uh, uh, it is actually developing like this in the transit. Uh, it, uh, it is very important, uh, for example, in our balance, uh, it, uh, its contribution is over 50%. We also have uh, uh, some coal and oil, of course. Uh, and um, uh, also nuclear and renewables. Uh, but uh, when we speak about renewables here and in Russia, it is uh, mostly about large hydro. 
the contribution of new alternative for renewables uh, is minor, uh, but we have uh, supporting programs. I will uh, tell a few words about them a little bit later. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, in this picture, it is more about uh, hydro when uh, we see renewables. Uh, if we compare our balance with the world average, we'll see that uh, somehow it is cleaner and the gas can be regarded as quite um, a good option, especially uh, during the transitional period. And we are actually planning to develop uh, our other low carbon uh, directions like uh, nuclear, like uh, hydro and uh, alternative renewables as well. Um, I would also like to stress here that um, coal in electricity uh, faces uh, rather high competition uh, from gas and uh, our inner demand is decreasing and it is also a long-standing trend. Um, mostly coal uh, consumption in Russia uh, is concentrated in Far East and Siberia. Uh, but there are also programs, for example, programs of gasification. Uh, so uh, our balance um, will be changing as well toward uh, more low carbon options. And then I would like to uh, say a few words about our contribution to energy markets. It's also uh, an important um, point uh, for us to, to discuss energy transition, to discuss uh, climate policy. Uh, for example, our contribution to production of energy is around 10% and our inner consumption is only 5%. So the rest is uh, uh, exported to the world markets, uh, which um, on the whole makes us uh, one of the leading uh, energy suppliers and um, it is traditional source of energy, oil, gas and uh, well, uh, coal. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, you can see that um, about and even more than 50% and of interregional trade today uh, is also in energy uh, products is also uh, supported by our suppliers. On the other hand, energy sector plays a leading role in our economy. It is also should be taken into consideration because uh, when it comes to, for example, 15% of uh, our economy GDP uh, last year, though it is less than a few years ago, uh, and uh, about 28% of uh, our federal budget and 85% uh, of exports and goods. Um, it is oil and gas contribution. It is really a challenge to face global energy transformation. Uh, but uh, this is a challenge that we are going to meet and uh, to join the transformation processes we are witnessing at the moment. Uh, so now, uh, given this uh, um, basic uh, data uh, on greenhouse gas emissions uh, and our energy balance, I'd like to move closer to uh, the history of our climate policy. Uh, here on the slide, you can see um, the landmarks uh, of what happened. Of course, everything began with uh, uh, UNFCCC. Uh, Russia joined uh, this agreement, thus recognizing uh, the global uh, problem of climate change, its anthropogenic uh, nature and the necessity uh, for actions. Uh, with the red color, I mentioned what was happening uh, at the international level and uh, with the blue color, what was primarily uh, happening in our inner domestic policy. So on the first stage, during the first period, um, for example, of Kyoto Protocol, our uh, climate policy uh, was uh, more concentrated at the international level. Uh, though Russia did not participate in the second phase of the Kyoto Protocol. And uh, during this period, let's uh, call this of uh, some failures in international coordination, we began to focus more and more uh, on our domestic issues. And the first just core uh, legislation in this uh, climate sphere was our climate doctrine uh, of, uh, 2009, of 2009. It was quite a common document, but uh, what is important is uh, that in that document, 
uh, the adaptation issues were already stressed, and it is still one of uh, the main areas of our climate policy. Then a few comprehensive uh, roadmaps uh, followed. We had our national goals. Uh, maybe um, the most um, uncertain period was uh, for us, for our inner policy, uh, was a period uh, when uh, we were discussing uh, joining Paris Agreement because Russia signed it um, with most of the countries. But we also um, created uh, a roadmap for um, ratification of Paris Agreement. And there were many discussions, uh, there were many assessments. Uh, but finally, uh, in um, the end of 2019, Russia joined Paris Agreement. And uh, this is another landmark uh, event uh, because then uh, we uh, uh, now have uh, some clarity and uh, we uh, witnesses that our climate policy had accelerated. Uh, you can see uh, that many different uh, documents uh, were then presented uh, and um, uh, that uh, most of them, maybe the principal one, uh, were presented and accepted uh, just this year. Uh, so the very often question here is why at uh, the end of uh, 2019, why now? Uh, sometimes uh, they say that uh, it is uh, quite closely connected with a possible climate restriction in uh, the region. UCBAM initiative, but um, uh, I think that there are more factors to uh, have influence uh, because uh, 2020 is a year when Paris Agreement uh, is becoming operational. And when our major um, partners in this club of largest emitters also have uh, unveiled uh, their new obligations and strategies. So I think it was a complex of factors. A uh, few words about our current goals and obligations. Uh, we have um, international obligations. So Russia, uh, as you get, as you could see, made its first in the sea, and uh, it is also reflected in our national uh, law. So it is obligatory for us. Uh, our current um, aim and our cur current goal uh, till 2030 is to have a reduction back to 70% by 2030 relative to the level of 1990. Uh, but it is also important to stress here that uh, all this uh, story is closely connected with social economic development uh, and the possibility uh, to um, unlock the potential of uh, observation capacities of our forest and other ecosystems. So it is uh, just a stress. Uh, it is also made in our NDC and the Paris Agreement. Uh, then uh, we had uh, a very special uh, statement just a few weeks before Glasgow uh, at Russian Energy Conference. Our president stated that we are going to be carbon neutral uh, by 2060. So we are joining the club of countries uh, that are claiming carbon neutrality, and we have the date, and this is also very important. Uh, now I would like to say a few words about our strategic planning. One of uh, the important events of this year was uh, uh, the introduction of our strategy of social economic development with low level of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it is. Um, our national uh, strategy, but uh, it is also connected with uh, the task of Paris Agreement to prepare uh, long strategies of development with uh, uh, low carbon emissions. So it is connected with uh, uh, international level efforts. Uh, here you can see the final results, but I should mention that um, the discussions uh, and uh, the process of uh, making this uh, making up this strategy was very complicated. Uh, we have only two scenarios left. Uh, this is our business as usual scenario, but it is only a reference one because uh, since we have uh, uh, 
a goal of climate neutrality. Our core and target scenario is intensive scenario, uh, which uh, is connected to this goal. So which is the, hopefully will lead us to uh, carbon neutrality. There were other uh, intermediate scenarios and some of them uh, in the previous, in the previous um, periods were regarded uh, as a target. Uh, but as you can see that we uh, finalized our strategy uh, with uh, the most uh, uh, intensive scenarios that we have. So I think it's also quite uh, illustrative. Uh, then we uh, are trying to coordinate our climate policy at national, regional and sectoral level, because we have a federal system, we have different branches. Uh, and uh, for example, if we take our adaptation plan, uh, we have um, an obligation for our uh, sectors uh, to create 10 adaptations plan in this year. And uh, then we expect that the next year, all our 85 region will present their own uh, adaptation plans and build on these uh, sectoral and uh, regional plans. Uh, we will elaborate uh, the overall national system of adaptation and um, climate uh, risks management. Uh, then it is about our legislation. Uh, it was also this year a very important event than our federal law on limitation of greenhouse gas emissions uh, was uh, accepted. It is already in place, but uh, there is quite an extensive set of uh, introducing regulations, which is currently uh, being implemented just to support uh, this uh, federal law because uh, it gives us some common directions and uh, we need uh, digitalization. But hopefully uh, everything will be done by the beginning of the next year. So we can uh, expect that our climate uh, registration uh, uh, and main ideas uh, in this sphere will give us opportunity to move on. Uh, what are the main directions uh, that are mentioned in this federal law? First of all, it uh, gives us a direction of how climate goals are established and how the progress is assessed. Uh, despite uh, this is reflected in the federal law, uh, it is still presidential decrees uh, with uh, which our climate goals are established. Uh, but uh, we expect to have um, a monitoring system with quite a short period of time to uh, have an opportunity uh, to understand better where we are and where we will move. And the two principal things about this law is that it is introducing reporting requirements for our large emitters. So before 2024, it will be obligatory to our uh, largest emitters with emissions above 150,000 per year uh, to make disclosure official disclosure and uh, one set of regulation is about uh, this uh, uh, disclosure procedures and verifications. And after 2024, um, this scope will be enlarged and uh, it uh, will be obligatory for all our uh, major emitters with uh, uh, emissions above 50,000. So uh, one direction of our climate policy is uh, uh, transparency. Uh, and better understanding on what is happening in our main uh, industrial sectors. The other dimension uh, is uh, uh, voluntary climate projects. Uh, yes, so we uh, do not have um, a very strict obligations uh, like um, waters or like uh, any other form of carbon prices in this law. Uh, it is somehow discussed for the federal level, but uh, the issue is very controversial. Uh, and I think it can be understood uh, because before I, I told about the role of energy sector and uh, fossil fuels uh, in our economy as for the moment. So we need some time to adopt. Uh, but um, by this law, we create a basis uh, for all under, uh, voluntary markets and we will hope that uh, we will see our first uh, project, our first attempts just the next year. 
because the bases are already here. Uh, what is also interesting uh, for us in terms of uh, even carbon uh, pricing is the federal law on carbon regulation experiments. It is still in draft, but again, we expect it to be accepted just uh, by the end of the year or maybe in the beginning of the next year. It is also in the government already and it is uh, more or less ready as a document. Why it is important? Uh, because uh, our regions uh, are not very free to go on with their own climate policy. They have to move on with all the rest regions uh, uh, within the national framework. But still, uh, we understand that we have uh, to look for better options to go on with our policy on the whole. So this federal law will give opportunities for some of the regions to test uh, their own uh, regulations and the first region to um, go into such an experiment is the Sakhalin region. It is the only island region in the Russian Federation. And uh, it has uh, it is the first uh, region that claimed being climate neutral uh, in 2025. So uh, it uh, uh, already uh, has its own strategy. Uh, glad to mention that it will be presented very soon, December 14. Uh, on the basis of the Center of Strategic Research. Um, and uh, so we, we will see how exactly the Sakhalin region uh, will um, achieve uh, its climate neutrality, what would be the measures. Uh, and um, uh, again, it has a very clear connection with uh, uh, federal legislation. Uh, but uh, the reporting requirements, for example, are expected to be uh, more strict. So uh, the school The most important element here is that uh, this experiment uh, presupposes that there will be quotas for the largest emitters. So we see a clear connection between requirements uh, uh, and transparency and quotas. And uh, uh, there will be somehow uh, a price of carbon in this experiment. So we, we begin uh, to, um, to test these options. And there will be additional incentives for um, companies, uh, for uh, other sectors to uh, decrease uh, their emissions. Uh, it is also should be mentioned that our other regions um, demonstrate uh, interest in, uh, in this experiment. Um, just uh, maybe uh, about five regions are ready to follow at the moment uh, and uh, when this federal law is in place, when we'll see how it will work, I think that more experiments will follow. Uh, this is uh, what about the common framework, uh, common um, directions of uh, our climate policy, but I would also pay attention to what uh, is already in place, what measures uh, support uh, our transition toward uh, green and cleaner future uh, because of course uh, there are already uh, some efforts uh, on the ground and uh, mainly it's about energy sector also quite understandable um, in terms of its contribution towards the total of uh, our greenhouse gas emissions um, you can see that uh, we have uh, an incentives uh, program for uh, renewables, uh, both on the home, on the whole uh, sale market, on retail markets, and even um, just a few years ago, we have introduced uh, the legislation for micro generation. So we uh, are now witnessing how uh, our prosumer class uh, is being formed. I think it is also quite illustrative. But the main support for new renewables is capacity delivery agreements on the whole market uh, um, of electricity. Uh, it's a subsidy actually from uh, the rest of the market to the greener producer. Uh, and um, what is also, uh, I think, interesting about our renewable support program is that it has a stress on localization. So for us at the moment, it's more about the uh, story of uh, technological advances and um, enlarging export potential. Uh, but uh, it's uh, a good sign for our renewable uh, direction is that uh, 
our support program was just um, this year prolonged toward uh, 2035. So we will support it until 2035, then we expect that it, uh, be, it will become competitive with the rest of our electricity producer, producers. Uh, then we have some uh, measures in, for example, oil and gas. Uh, we have uh, a huge potential in terms of improving our energy efficiency, and it's about uh, losses, for example, in uh, electricity and heating networks, and the work is done here Probably the more spread option is uh, best available technologies. And uh, maybe uh, I will now make a stress that um, our measures uh, in climate policy are not just uh, the direct measures as carbon prices, but at the moment they are more um, measures um, connected with other areas of our policy. For example, if we uh, take best available technologies. It's about our ecological uh, policy and standards. We are moving uh, toward best technologies here for improving um, ecological situation in Russia, especially in the largest cities. And uh, it is um, also important for us because, for example, uh, our population uh, as uh, our sociological surveys show is ready at the moment to support uh, ecological uh, decisions, options, and even to pay more for uh, better ecology. Because I see uh, just uh, um, the results of these actions uh, on their own uh, sides, uh, and uh, it is quite fast. But the perception of climate policy is still controversial. And uh, of course, we have uh, some um, uh, initiatives in education and schools, maybe uh, in the universities, but still uh, the perception uh, of uh, these climate uh, issues and um, the perspective to pay more for uh, future decisions uh, for uh, the global uh, positions uh, is um, under discussion. So uh, we have to look for uh, some win-win strategies, for example, connecting our climate measures with ecological measures, uh, our climate measures with measures in energy efficiency, just again, the support, uh, well, because it will take some time for a um, larger part of our population also to get more and more involved in climate issues and to hopefully, uh, show more support to our climate policy uh, on the whole. Uh, for example, our energy, uh, our Ministry of uh, Economic um, Policy uh, is uh, uh, at the moment uh, in the process of renewing our um, plan for energy efficiency. And it is trying to make a connection, a clear connection between the measures in energy efficiency and uh, the potential results in uh, reduction of greenhouse gases to make it easier even for business to make uh, just uh, a complex uh, positions in their own strategies. Uh, then we have uh, different uh, initiatives in transport. Uh, it is not just electricity transport because we have uh, some issues in terms of our territory, of our West territory. Uh, but uh, we support, for example, infrastructural development in um, some principal areas. And uh, it is also support for natural gas, motor fuel. Uh, in terms of uh, forestry sector, it is one of the core elements for us and it is uh, stressed uh, in, I think, every uh, large discussion that we are uh, willing to, uh, to develop the sector and uh, to uh, attract investment and uh, international uh, cooperation uh, and to develop international cooperation in this year. Uh, and I would like to mention such an initiative, uh, such an initiative uh, here is a carbon Polygon uh, pilot program administrated by our Ministry of uh, Higher uh, Education and Science. So it will be testing sites in few regions where we'll test different uh, observation technologies. 
to understand better the observation capacities of our forest and other ecosystems, for example, swamps, meadows, all the rest. And then uh, the uh, next step will be to uh, develop carbon farms. So to uh, have an opportunity to create a value and to attract business to this project. Uh, currently it was uh, started uh, just uh, uh, last year uh, and the uh, pilot uh, program, um, it has uh, seven regions, uh, but again, more regions uh, will join already, it is clear. So our regions are showing growing interest to the climate agenda and this is also a good sign, I think. Uh, and um, uh, probably it is uh, uh, the set of options we have, but of course, when we will introduce entirely our uh, climate legislation, we will have more direct options. Uh, and here I think I come to my uh, concluding remarks. Uh, as you can see, uh, all our principal goals, all our principal strategies and laws are finally in place, thanks to 2021. Um, actually, uh, much was done during this period by our ministries. Uh, and uh, so now I think we can move from uh, goal setting to actions. And uh, well, if everything will be as we plan, I think that the first results uh, of these uh, actions or we can expect in the next year. So thank you very much for your attention. I will be glad to answer any question you have. Thank you very much, Irina. We greatly appreciate your presentation. And as I said before, we're gonna bring in Natalia and Jan, and then we open up for questions for everybody. So with that, I leave the floor to Natalia Wolchkova. Um, thank you, Irina, for a very detailed exposure of the action plan of uh, part of Russian government and all the uh, hierarchy of goals and uh, efforts and actions and plans uh, and different uh, aspects of uh, uh, decarbon uh, decarbonization. Um, we do understand and you clearly emphasize this that uh, there are several, there are a number of uh, ways that need to be implemented uh, to deal with, uh, to achieve the ultimate goal. And in my uh, short comment, I want to uh, focus on a bit on um, one uh, aspect of this process on energy efficiency, because I believe for Russia, uh, besides other uh, decarbonization efforts, this one is uh, one of the ultimate, of the uh, very, uh, very strong importance. And the reason is that uh, still Russia lags uh, well behind of uh, the world as a whole and a number of uh, uh, countries uh, in terms of uh, energy uh, efficiency, energy intensity. Uh, and uh, despite efforts on, uh, aimed at uh, decrease in energy uh, intensity, still uh, there is a long way uh, to go. And because uh, energy sector and energy use in uh, other uh, economic sectors produce a lot of uh, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, it is important to deal with this problem, um, and uh, the, uh, th this is well recognized by Russian government, an increase in GDP energy intensity is considered as a national strategic goal, and the goal, the current goal is to reach 50% decline in carbon footprint due to energy uh, production and energy use in uh, eco economic activity, 50% uh, decline in this footprint till 2030 uh, through uh, exclusively energy intensity decline. Uh, and uh, this emphasizes this uh, important role uh, and important measures that need to be implemented in order to reach this goal. And uh, the um, uh, important uh, way to deal with this problem 
is to uh, understand uh, what are the uh, mechanisms that can uh, lead us to the ultimate goal. This uh, graph represents uh, the, um, uh, the the composition of the change in uh, uh, in uh, energy use by uh, uh, economy uh, to produce uh, GDP. Uh, the change uh, over the one year, 2019 uh, to, uh, relative to 2018, is decomposed uh, by different factors. And economic growth definitely uh, increases the, uh, the use of uh, uh, energy in uh, production. Um, structural change uh, across sectors and within sectors contribute in different ways. To change in uh, composition uh, in the uh, in use of uh, fuels, and the only managed uh, factor uh, in this decomposition is technology improvement. It uh, offsets, for example, by third, uh, the increase in uh, use of energy uh, for uh, growth uh, or for economic growth. Uh, purpose. So uh, this technology improvement, this techn oh, it is called technological factor, is considered to be a very important uh, a way uh, to achieve the goal of decline in uh, dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide emission in econo economic activities. Uh, so uh, the government proposes uh, a number of the whole set of uh, measures and tools to, to uh, specifically uh, aim this technology improvement, technological improvement as a mean to uh, deal with uh, uh, the uh, energy intensity. So uh, the import, uh, the, uh, I, would I, I can divide these measures in two groups. One is uh, pure regulatory measures, that is, uh, bottom line requirements on energy efficiency, sector specific sector regulation, ban on certain technology. So this is uh, uh, regulation. And on this other side, there are a number of uh, measures that our government is um, considering to implement, which uh, will produce uh, positive incentives for the uh, private sector uh, to improve energy efficiency. Uh, white certificates are um, in a way uh, is um, already in the process of uh, um, uh, not yet implemented by being implemented, but it is very, uh, very thoroughly discussed and uh, put in um, strategy as well. Another way, another uh, tool that the government uh, considers uh, in that regard is best available technology codification and certification. It's already five years uh, that Russia is uh, working on this, and now it's also considered to be an important ingredient of the uh, energy efficiency uh, improvement as a whole and climate change as well, because uh, one of the potential way to use this uh, mechanism is to introduce a uh, carbon footprint directly in the codification of the best available technologies. So uh, this is the state of the station in with respect to energy efficiency and I believe this would be an important uh, instrument and important mechanism to deal with the whole um, uh, decrease in carbon or footprint of the Russian economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia. Uh, John, please. Um, well, thank you very much uh, for uh, this uh, kind of contribution in terms of energy efficiency. I would entirely agree uh, that um, for example, uh, in Russia, it is uh, one of uh, the best options, uh, especially in the moment to go on 
uh, with uh, decreasing our emissions. And uh, again, it's a win-win strategy for us. It will be uh, accepted by uh, business because uh, uh, it is also obvious that they have an interest uh, in uh, improving their business results as well. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, I think that, um, uh, well, this connection between uh, climate and energy policy uh, is becoming more and more important for us and such a tool as uh, carbon footprints um, is also important, for example, uh, in terms of uh, having a possibility to compare our efforts uh, with, uh, for example, European benchmarks, because we will have to do so uh, in the nearest future if uh, we will have a carbon adjustment mechanism. So it is very important to understand all uh, these uh, details in terms of uh, our footprints and how it is connected probably with the measures in energy efficiency sphere. So we can have a, a more general discussion also after Jan's presentation, but Jan, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I will present to you a little bit about the CEDA cooperation with Russia when it comes to environment and climate change. And I will start with a picture of uh, the landfill in the city of Petrosavodsk in the Karelian Republic. And you may wonder what, what this has to do with Swedish cooperation with Russia on this sphere. And I hope that this will become clear uh, during and after the presentation. Uh, however, the basis for Swedish cooperation adopted by the Swedish government and the current strategy that we have for Russia that is from, uh, from 2020 to 2024. And uh, this strategy, it contains two different sectors. It's a uh, support to democracy and human rights. And secondly, there's also support to environment and climate. And when it comes to this strategy that we're working on, uh, there are three different things that are supposed to be focused on in this uh, for environment and climate. And that is uh, that CEDA should support to strengthen the capacity in Russia for Firstly, sustainable management of natural resources, biodiversity, and also reduce emissions to the Baltic Sea. And the second priority is that we should also support to strengthen capacity in Russia when it comes to combating climate change and also phasing out of fossil fuels. And thirdly, uh, Sweden and CEDA should support a strengthening of the civil society and also other relevant uh, actors that work within environment and, and climate. And uh, to the disposal of CEDA, we have a budget of roughly 6.5 million euros per year. And uh, I should also say that the, the, uh, the hardest uh, part of this is to work with the second one, I mean, combat climate change and phasing out of fossil fuels, because there's a quite a different view from, from Sweden and Russia when it comes to, to these questions. But that's interesting still. Okay, but in order to understand what Sweden has been doing and what we're trying to achieve, we need to go back a little bit in time. We need to go back to, to the beginning of the 2000s when, because the main vehicle for Swedish support to Russia in environment and climate that has been the Northern Dimension Environmental Partnership, the NDEP. And this fund is a, it's a multilateral trust fund. It was established under the Finnish EU presidency in 2002. And the thinking behind Finland's proposal to do this was that EU cooperation with the South and the East or neighbors in the South and East uh, was more priority to than to the cooperation with the North. So the NDP was one, one way to increase the cooperation between EU and the EU countries with Russia. And the NDP ever since its creation has had two windows. Uh, there's one window for nuclear safety, uh, which is 100% grant funded from this trust fund. 
And the second window that we will focus on today, that is the non-nuclear projects, environment and climate related projects. And in this, uh, this sector, it's loan combined with grants. And the primary objective of this part is to improve environment in the Baltic and Barents sea, Seas region of the Northern Dimension area. So this is the basis, the vehicle that Sweden has been using. And on this slide, you see that the total financing having been made available to NDP since 2002. So you can see that for the nuclear window, there's roughly 172 million euro. And for the environmental window, it's 182 roughly. And uh, you can also note that uh, Russia, they are themselves the biggest donor and also uh, recipient of funds from this environmental window. And uh, Sweden has from the very beginning been uh, a big donor, and we have followed this work during all, all these uh, years. And then this is how the structure of NDP works, because there needs to be, I mean, it's a combination of grants and loans, and uh, uh, there are so-called implementing agencies that initiate and uh, implement the projects. And the, the the, these agencies, they are IFIs, the five IFIs that you can see on the picture. So they are EBRD, they are European Investment Bank, the German KFW, Nordic Investment Bank, and also NEFCO. And the structure for these projects has been, I mean, if you take, for example, you want to do a 20 million euro project to improve wastewater treatment in the city of Russia. Then uh, the 20 million euro project, you get 12 million in loan from EBRD. You get 6 million euro in grants from the NDP. And then normally there's also uh, local funds available for the project. And then the implementing agency, in this case EBRD, they will then, uh, I mean, help implementation of the project. I mean, make sure that tendering and procurement and, and implementation is done in a transparent and, and good manner. Uh, one thing to note, however, is that uh, out of these five IFIs, uh, the biggest ones, they stopped uh, any new lending to Russia in 2014 after the uh, Russian uh, annexation of Crimea. So nowadays, it's only NEFCO that can do new projects in, uh, with support from NDP. Okay, so this is the area that we are focusing on. And these are some of the cities that have uh, received financing from the NDP. And all in all, there have been 30 projects being approved financing from NDP. And 17 of those have already been completed. And the vast majority of projects so far, they have been in wastewater sector, I mean, to improve the wastewater treatment of uh, municipal wastewater treatment plants in Russia and also in, in Belarus. And one example of a good project that has been completed is the construction of a wastewater treatment plant in Kaliningrad, uh, a city with more than 500,000 inhabitants that up till 2017 did not have any proper wastewater treatment. So NDP was used as a, a co-financier for this project and was used very successfully. Okay, but then we come to the solid landfill, solid waste landfill in Petrosavodsk, because this is also one of the projects that have received financing from the NDP. And uh, uh, it's still active, this project. And the total financing for the project is roughly 12 million euros, and uh, it will consist of a loan from NEFCO for 4 million euros, will be a grant, 3 million euro from the NDP, and there will also be a local financing. And the scope of the project that will be firstly to close the old landfill, which is currently one of the Baden Sea hotspots. 
And uh, in the closure, they will also uh, arrange the capture of methane ga gas from, from this uh, landfill. And the second part of this project will be a construction of a new EU compliant landfill. And thirdly, there will also be a sorting facility uh, in connection to the new landfill. And once this project will be completed, there will be reduced emissions of CO2 by 143,000 tons per year, which is quite substantial. So this all looks very good. However, there is one big but, and that is that this project was, was approved already in 2011, and it has still not started. So it's been restructured many times since 2011, and uh, in the beginning, the thought was that uh, NEFCO would be, be lending to the municipal utility company in Petrozavodsk, operating the solid waste management in the city. However, since uh, 2011, there has been a big reform on solid waste management in Russia, where solid waste management has been organized into regional, regional companies that are now taking uh, care of the solid waste management. So from this point of view, the project had to be restructured from the beginning. Once it was thought to be a municipal company implementing. And then after a few years, uh, they had to start negotiations with the regional company. And uh, this is actually the project proposal that they have accepted with the regional company. However, then the regional company, they decided that they would de do a concession for a private operator that will operate and uh, collect the public. And this happened only last summer, or I think uh, this summer. And this meant that NEFCO will then start to negotiate with this private investor. So this means that the project proposal that has been approved by NDEP will need to be restructured but when this was discussed at the latest assembly of contributors to NDP, uh, we all thought that it would be a good idea to, to continue working with this and see what we can do. And one other comment that I would like to make in connection to this is that uh, the Russian uh, view on management of solid waste uh, is somewhat different to the view of the European Union and also the Western countries. Russia is looking more for uh, big scale solutions, I mean, where they have landfills and big sorting facilities and constructing waste incineration plants. And as you know, in Europe and also Western countries, there is more of a holistic approach where uh, you start uh, recycling and you start sorting at the source, you spread public awareness among the population that you should sort the waste before sending it to, to, to landfills and uh, you should use extended produ producers responsibility, making uh, companies uh, engage in this process as well. So basically in, in EU and, and European countries, there is basically nothing put on landfills and everything is tried to be recycled. But this is still uh, a different of approach and we still believe that it would be important to be able to, to cooperate with Russia to, to do these projects. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and look forward to questions and a debate on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, so we have a few minutes for some Q&A and I received a couple of questions. Uh, maybe um, I just wanna start off by giving Irina a little bit of an opportunity to maybe react to sort of John's presentation as well. If you if you want. Well, uh, yes, I think it's uh, a very important uh, part because the waste management uh, is not very much highlighted still, unfortunately, in the framework of climate combating change. Oh, of, clim of combating climate change, I'm sorry. Uh, but more and more work um, is done in this year. And I think that uh, such an examples with a clear assessment of the results and the potential are very important. And uh, yes, uh, I can support that we are going through a very large scale reform uh, 
and many things um, are still uh, to be uh, maybe clarified. So we are just in the middle of the story and it has been implemented. So I think that uh, maybe these uh, delays are partially connected with uh, the whole system restructuring problem. And uh, hopefully it, uh, it will uh, uh, be successful because it's very interesting and important for the region project. Uh, and I just, uh, I wonder, uh, this is uh, um, uh, the example of waste uh, management uh, is uh, the main direction of interest uh, besides nuclear, or um, you can name some other interesting uh, direction of cooperation in the sphere of climate uh, change combating. For example, I renewable I project. suppose this was a question for me. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, if we look at the NDP, uh, apart from, from waste, uh, solar waste management and wastewater treatment, there's also uh, projects in the district heating sector. So there's actually one other project, long-standing project in uh, the, the city of Gatchina, south of St. Petersburg, mm -hmm. where the, the NDP will co-finance the investments into the um, making more effective the district heating system in, in Gatchin and also reducing the CO2 mm -hmm. emissions. But of course, I mean, CEDA and, and uh, our, our colleagues at the embassy in Moscow and in St. Petersburg, we are always open to new proposals for how we could cooperate with Russia when it comes to, especially this uh, second uh, priority about uh, combating climate change and, and fossil facing out the fossil fuels. So we're always open for new possibilities and new discussions. Okay, excellent, thank you. So I have a couple of questions from the floor. So let me uh, first bring up one. So to Irina then, so how much does the deforestation in Siberia, which has accelerated in recent years, affect both Russian and global climate policy? And in view of this trend, are the climate goals declared by Russia just simple declarations that do not lead to the adoption of real obligations? Oh, well, it's a very uh, important question for us uh, because uh, forest fires uh, is among one of the priorities in the whole story of uh, our forestry sector. Of course, uh, it is uh, a reason for anxiety, uh, but uh, it is um, an issue on control and it is well uh, monitored and uh, more and more actually actions uh, are implemented in this sphere. So hopefully we, uh, we can uh, just uh, make the situation a little bit be better, but of course uh, it is great. Uh, what for our obligations? Well, I um, think that uh, here we need to stress that uh, when it comes to forests, uh, we uh, make an account for manageable forests. And this is not just the whole territory of our forests. Uh, this is the first point. And then uh, still we um, with this even carbon polygons and the other actions, uh, we are trying to somehow make a balance of uh, this um, forests uh, that are gone with, with a fire and uh, new uh, forests uh, that uh, can make a uh, contribution to our goals. I think something. Uh, like this is happening, but of course, uh, this is a very important issue. Thank you, Irina. We, we have another question that I think is more addressed to John. Uh, Heinz Schögen is asking, has CEDA noticed a more serious and sincere interest from Russian authorities when it comes to sustainability, recycling, and environment? Uh, I mean, on the face of it, we see increased uh, interest from Russian side. Uh, I mean, they have changed the policy to some extent when it comes to uh, reducing emissions. Uh, but in reality, I think that there's not been much change in on the ground. I mean, what they really do to introduce renewable energy apart from uh, nuclear and, and uh, uh, hydropower. So from that point of view, I mean, there is no uh, real shift in Russia at this point of time. They still remain, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 
remain working with uh, the current uh, uh, economic model based on fossil fuels. Irina, do you want to comment that or? Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, yes, we have uh, um, such uh, maybe a problem in terms of uh, energy transition uh, because our economy is uh, at the moment uh, still uh, in greater part based on uh, energy uh, sector. Uh, but uh, we are also uh, now understand that we will have to change and uh, that's, uh, I think maybe with all these new initiatives in place now, uh, we will see some changes in the ground as well, because just a uh, few years, 2020, 2021, just uh, a huge, uh, a huge uh, set of new initiatives, uh, legislative initiatives. And maybe we need some time just to see how it all will work. Thank you. So we're, we're basically running out of time, but I just wanted to have one final question to, to Irina from, from Chloe. So I, I was wondering if you could say something about the design of renewable support in Russia, in particular rules related to the allocation process, i.g. auctions, participation requirements, remuneration schemes, and so on. So maybe a little bit more details in terms of how this support is designed. Uh, well, uh, we have quite uh, an interesting mechanism, not very widespread. Uh, it is based on capacity uh, auctions. So uh, it is the main um, part of the support on the wholesale market. Uh, it uh, is uh, based uh, for three types of renewables, solar, wind, and uh, biomass. Uh, and um, uh, for uh, participating, our companies and other, com other companies uh, should uh, demonstrate, for example, uh, the, uh, the criteria. And I think that in our new prolonged program, there will be also criteria for export potential. Uh, so this is our options and this connection with uh, uh, capacity uh, that will be directed with the support. Uh, from the wholesale market participants, something like that. So thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, Irina. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Natalia. So now we will get somewhat shorter presentations on several different countries in Eastern Europe. So we'll take the presentation sequentially, and then at the end, we will open up for questions from you all through the Q&A function in the Zoom. So our very first presenter is Bernardas Padigimas, who is a team leader for environmental policy and strategy at the Stockholm Environment Institute here in Stockholm. And Bernardas will talk about Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, after that, we have Norberto Pignatti, who is an associate professor of policy at the International School of Economics at the Tbilisi State University, ICET, and also head of the Energy and Environmental Policy Center at ICET Policy Institute. So Norberto will talk about Georgia. After that, we have Eugenia Shershunovic, who is an analyst at Bayrock and PhD candidate at the Center for Development Research at the University of Bond. Eugenia will talk about Belarus. And then finally, we have Maxim Fedosenko, who is the head of strategic projects at the Kiev School of Economics, in School of Economics Institute in Kiev, who will talk about Ukraine. But with that, please, Bernardas, the microphone is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, um, pleasure to be here and hello to everyone. Um, let me share my slides. Um, uh, so my name is Bernardo Spadegimas and I'm a team lead and a project manager at Stockholm Environment Institute. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to join and um, Today I'll talk uh, uh, a little bit uh, more about Bosnia and Herzegovina and a project that we're uh, doing with SCI. But briefly, I'll tell a little bit about uh, uh, SCI and uh, a bit of a team that I work and also the further plans that we um, uh, have in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So quickly about Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, it's an independent international research and policy institute uh, working on the 
broad spectrum of uh, environmental, climate, uh, and energy-related uh, issues. Um, uh, on the left side, you can see uh, our current strategy, uh, main areas uh, of focus that we're, we're looking at, so mainly climate risk, resource use, and uh, um, improved health and well-being. We have around 350 staff uh, around the world with the headquarters in Stockholm. Uh, the team of environment and policy and strategy uh, that I'm leading at the CI is, uh, um, is, is basically a team of experts uh, that focusing on a very practical application of, uh, of the, also the science and practices that are being done at the CI. And uh, so our main focus within the team is to support and work with different uh, uh, governments in, uh, in supporting them in compliance with different agendas, provide technical assistance and different environmental related transitions and reforms, such as EU uh, environmental approximation or, or different in relation to decarbonization or circular economy. And at the same time to build the capacities required for, for such transitions. Um, the main uh, 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 scope geographically is uh, Western Balkans, uh, Eastern Europe and Caucasus. Uh, uh, but of course, also this is not uh, limited, but this is our primary uh, focus areas. Um, going now to the project. And uh, so the project is uh, Bosnia Herzegovina Environmental Strategy and Action Plan. Um, but before that, just to maybe give a few minutes of the background, uh, uh, but probably most of the uh, uh, participants know, but Bosnia-Herzegovina has uh, quite a complex administrative and governance system. And since Dayton agreement, uh, it was agreed to, to divide the, the country administratively into entities and a district. Uh, so there is a Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina and there is, there is a Republika Srpska and there is a district of Brčko. And there is also a, a state level. So, but the complexity comes that uh, the let's say between the two entities in a district, uh, they have separate uh, parliaments, they have separate governments, they have separate laws. Uh, let's say like in environmental law, which not always are compatible. So, which makes sometimes uh, quite hard to work on uh, country level. Um, so. Just a quick background into the project. And uh, in 2018, uh, uh, two entities uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina approached Swedish embassy in Sarajevo requesting to support in the development of environmental strategy. And uh, uh, there's never been the strategy on the country level. There's been uh, the Federation had a strategy and currently a Brisco district has a strategy, but uh, Republika Srpska never had one. So this was a kind of a first of its kind. And uh, then Swedish embassy uh, uh, contacted the CI to support and provide technical assistance to that. Uh, and uh, uh, we're working closely with the EU delegation, with a big network of NGOs, and very, working very closely with uh, the governments and ministries from um, all the different jurisdictions. Um, quickly about, so the main objective, of course, is to develop the, the actual strategy and action plans, but at the same time, we're aiming to improve a bit of the capacity in the authorities. To where we have a big focus on the mainstreaming of gender equality, social equity, and poverty reduction that I'll tell uh, a little bit later, and to also uh, raise awareness uh, of the general public about the situation, about opportunities, and uh, what's happening with this plan, basically, and, and also uh, to have effective cooperation with the uh, active NGO uh, uh, sector. And on the right side, you just see the kind of a graph of showing, you know, uh, kind of try to simplify the, 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 the complexity of it. So we're talking about Bosnia and Herzegovina Environment Strategy and Action Plan, which actually comprises of the two entity and the district uh, environment strategies and action plan, because this is required, requested per each law. But then we collect it in aggregated version and have the uh, overall country strategy. And this is also important to mention is one of the also uh, uh, ways of Bosnia and Herzegovina showcasing its progress within the uh, EU and showcasing in terms of uh, application and approximation of EU environmental key. Um, Quickly of where we are now within the project, so we are almost 80%, uh, I would say, uh, finished and uh, we so we finalized all the main uh, kind of components we have uh, identified the, the, the kind of all the measures required and, uh, and targets. So now we're in, in the phase of really to just understanding polishing bits and pieces and doing uh, cost.
in financially. We're working on prioritization, so also try to be as realistic as possible to make sure that you know we understand what has to go first, what are the main priority, and what should be done. Um, there's a strategic environmental assessment taking place as well, uh, which is going to be a, a, a sort of infusing information also of how to what could be changed, where the potential impacts could be, so we can adjust timely. And there's also uh, plans of a public consultations upcoming and uh, adoption procedures. Um, I'll I'll try to explain a little bit more about uh, the kind of the project design because uh, it's uh, uh, it's if you see in sort of the situation is quite complex and to kind of make it all work and function is not uh, not very easy task. Uh, uh, but so we from very beginning acknowledged that uh, for us one of the most important thing is to make sure that uh, uh, the the authorities and the governments are owners of this process that they're driving this. Uh, so we designed like a three sort of, uh, uh, we have like a mechanisms of let's say three sort of levels. So we have a working group, which is very big group and it's an expert level and uh, the representatives from all sorts of different sectors. And uh, so they're the main kind of mechanisms of building the actual plans uh, from the very beginning. All the working groups are led by the lead experts coming from Bosnia Herzegovina and also supported with the specific experts from Stockholm Environment Institute, uh, also from Swedish Environmental Protection uh, uh, Agency and also Swedish Chemical Agency. Um, then we have a second uh, uh, part, uh, which is an assistant minister level groups, and these are the groups that are uh, supports and kind of guides, uh, you know, the drafts and information and advices were needed, and uh, and also kind of approves uh, certain documents. And the top part or the highest level is the steering board, uh, which is a minister level, and uh, so and all these three sort of mechanisms uh, uh, happen like in a loop. So there's a working groups doing the work, then we meet at the assistant minister level, and then we go into the minister level to approve or bring sort of main um, issues that remain. Quickly about uh, the composition or the focus of environment strategy and action plans, and these are the thematic areas, and these are the, the, also the working groups that are taking place. And the thematic areas are sort of uh, uh, encompassing all the European environmental key areas as well. And we have uh, around 659 total numbers in all the working groups. So it's a huge number for a small country, but also it's important to understand that it's, we have the working groups in all four jurisdictions uh, working. Um, and just also uh, add on top, what does it mean with the different organizations involved from this number? So you can see that we have in total 28 working groups because four jurisdictions, seven thematic areas, and we have four policy groups. And you can see the distribution and a quite uh, good representation of different and public and private and academia and also uh, NGO uh, sectors. Um, this is a graph showcasing of how this kind of public uh, uh, or a participatory approach is happening. So it's organized around this working group uh, uh, from the very beginning. And we have two, the, the yellow uh, um, uh, parts, it's uh, the opportunities for public to consult and, uh, and see the kind of draft documents and make their inputs as well. It's important also to understand, and I said the working one working group round is actual 23 meetings. So it is very uh, logistically heavy exercise uh, um, that is uh, sort of uh, taking place. And it's important to mention that we are now finished five rounds. So we have only the last round, which is more sort of uh, uh, to polish certain uh, bits and pieces. And just quickly, what are those working groups are about? Um, so as I mentioned, there's six. And in the first one, we, you know, we, we brought everyone, we discussed the key challenges, the issues from different sides and sectors. Then we moved into uh, transferring in them into objectives. Then in the third one, we talked about baselines and targets. And also in the fourth one, we identified specific measures that are required to achieve those targets and, you know, and, and reach the objectives. And uh, so the whole process is uh, uh, sort of coming from this uh, work of the working groups. Uh, they will build the uh, uh, seven thematic chapters with all the uh, all the thematic areas, and which will come up with the uh, environmental strategies and action plan, also in the jurisdiction level, which then will be aggregated, compiled, and will go to the Council of Ministers in Bosnia and Herzegovina to further adoption. Um, 
this process also was designed before COVID happened. So you can imagine that having such a, a amount of people and, and such a heavy log logistical exercise uh, made, you know, COVID made it even more complicated. So uh, we still, we agreed that we need to move on and we moved into virtual space. And this is just a, maybe one example I wanted to highlight of what happened, you know, with the kind of adaptations that we had to do. And from the first round of meetings online, we noticed that a lot of uh, uh, people from governments uh, were not having uh, sort of uh, equipment, either cameras or computers to join uh, sort of properly in a virtual space. So we quickly organized renting big rooms and organizing sort of in a safe manner tables with rented equipment and for people to enable people to come and join and be part of these meetings, uh, even though the situations were not favorable. Um, some um, project highlights uh, so far uh, where we at, and this is in addition to kind of the main aim of having the strategy and action plan and what we're seeing developing around it. So one, I think, very kind of uh, things that stands out is strategic environmental assessment. And uh, after uh, uh, some time, we're seeing that this is almost the very first kind of parallel SEA in Bosnia and Herzegovina, meaning that, I mean, the whole aim of SEI is to uh, uh, go in parallel to the, any policy or strategy development so that you can timely adjust it or identify some significant impacts. So, and uh, this is also based on, uh, you know, of course, local requirements and local laws, but also uh, looking at the USA directive for kind of best practices and guidance. Um, it is also done with the really uh, full ownership and commitment from all the governments, from the RSA consultant to work together to try to navigate and to make sure that all the adjustments and kind of new bits and pieces are in places. And uh, so it's really a, a big ownership also from government. And the last bit that is very important to mention is the, uh, uh, that we kind of doing a little bit on, on top of what is required, let's say, by the local regulation or the USA directive is that we are looking specifically at the gender, social equity and poverty reduction part and how SEI, SEA can help identify, uh, you know, if any measures that we're proposing within the action plans could potentially impact any, let's say, you know, any vulnerable groups or, you know, people changing, let's say, specific, you know, uh, taxation for the waste collection or things, can it affect someone who actually dependent on it? So we're trying to find different ways and tools to really identify that, you know, the new plans, they don't affect uh, 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 people um, in a different way. Um, Participatory approach and strategy making is this is also something that's been uh, in the beginning quite uh, tense, I can say that, you know, uh, I think people are not used to from governments and even NGOs, people were not used to doing a participatory approach. Uh, the method is that, you know, someone works and compiles the draft, and then they share with everyone, everyone makes a comment, and then it goes for the adoption. And we started doing from the very beginning, inviting everyone to share the inputs and their expertise and knowledge. And in the beginning, it was, you know, we kind of had a bit of a pushback where people thought, you know, uh, that this is uh, kind of a, a flawed uh, process uh, that we're asking everyone. But then uh, now we're seeing more and more people recognizing and understanding that really this is a really good approach and this really allows everyone to voice and everyone to participate in it. And, and all the kind of sectors uh, own this, you know, strategy in the end. Um, so this is definitely a, a potential for legacy, hopefully for the future policy strategy development in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, as one indicator, we're also noticing that, uh, you know, some, um, let's say, ministries are asking some other uh, international kind of uh, um, uh, actors to adjust their kind of methodologies to a, a little bit replicate of how we, we did it here. And also uh, this participatory approach kind of allowed inter, let's say, uh, some ministries to meet actually for the first time really uh, to, to meet and discuss and have planning opportunities. So, so showcasing from different sides and uh, uh, how this can really work and benefit. On, uh, on mainstreaming uh, gender equality, social equity and poverty reduction, uh, this has been a very also important part of a project and also supporting a, a Swedish uh, strong focus on it. 
uh, and we worked really to make sure that we, first of all, we involve, uh, you know, everyone in different groups uh, in the kind of, in the, in the decision making in thinking about it, understanding the issues and knowledge, but at the same time, really thinking of how this can influence, how these decisions and targets can have So we, we managed to actually involve quite different uh, 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 sort of uh, NGOs and different groups. Uh, we have gender centers from the older jurisdictions. We have different associations, let's say like Rome associations, part of the working groups were actively working. Um, and also we, we're working with experts from SEI, also in Boston and Sugovina of Cow, to make sure that we design it in the uh, best possible way so it, that we can kind of improve specific like energy emissions reduction and, and things like that, but at the same time uh, have as little social impact as possible. Uh, and last bit on the on the kind of uh, the achievements also and and the highlights in the project that we had a number of uh, webinars uh, uh, taking place uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina with our experts there inviting governments from Bosnia and Herzegovina and GOs. We invited different regional uh, also uh, of, uh, um, actors, let's say like from Croatia and Serbia to share their experiences in dealing with these things, dealing with approximation of EU process. We had people and from governments coming uh, and experts coming from uh, Baltic countries as well to share their experiences, how, how it happened uh, post uh, accession to EU. And uh, um, so uh, there's been a, a really uh, also interesting uh, work on that. And you can see we had um, uh, from in 11 webinars, we had uh, 815 participants, uh, which has been uh, quite a great outcome as well. And uh, Quickly, the last part uh, on there is that, uh, you know, so we're approaching the uh, towards the end of uh, finalization of this environmental strategy and action plan. So what happens next is that uh, we're in discussion and uh, uh, with, uh, with Sweden and also the governments in Bosnia and Herzegovina of how to make sure that we keep this positive momentum, uh, you know, from, uh, from the governments, from all the other sectors moving forward. So we're in the discussions on how can also SCI work together to support in assuring that the implementation takes place and the reporting and the capacity needed for it is in place. And uh, so how does that can work? And at the same time, we're in the discussions now on to maybe look a little bit further in two kind of cross-cutting areas. And I think this is something that's uh, very uh, prominent in today's uh, uh, discussions uh, as we saw before. So we're gonna look into decarbonization and circle economy. And the main focus will be to really look at uh, um, and to say that there's a lot of processes already happening and you know, from the governments and different actors and different uh, institutions. But what we're seeing that there is no holistic approach into really understanding in Bosnia Herzegovina of where the Bosnia Herzegovina is and what are the options, you know, what kind of pathways Bosnia Herzegovina could take actually to reduce emissions, and if, for example, what what kind of social implications are you know would come with such diff, uh, specific pathway where the money should be coming, you know, how do you utilize this? Um, so this is going to be uh, uh, the kind of uh, discussion points, or this is what we're going to be looking. Um, in the future. Um, that is it. So thank you very much. And you can see here, this is a website of the project and also an email if there is any questions or follow-ups after. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bernardas. Uh, Norberto, please. Hello, everyone. As mentioned, yeah, already by Anders, I am based in Pilisi. I, I am an associate professor of policy at the International School of Economics and head a center uh, on energy and environmental policy research at the ISET Policy Institute. Mm, we will be looking now uh, in this presentation quickly at, uh, at uh, the situation of Georgia and at the um, progress that uh, um, the country needs to, uh, to make if it wants to achieve its target. But let's start with the situation of Georgia. Well, you are probably all familiar with the country. It's, uh, um, Georgia is uh, a country of the South Caucasus and bordering with the uh, Russian Federation at the north and in the south with Turkey, Armenia, Azerbaijan. 
and as uh, um, in its west side um, bordering with the Black Sea. It is a mountainous um, country with an abundance of rivers and several climate zones ranging from continental to temperate to subtropical. So um, with a population of about 4 million people. When we look at the current situation of Georgia in terms of energy needs um, and uh, um, what is the contribution of domestic um, production of energy versus imports, we see that the country is heavily dependent from imports. Uh, as in 2019, according to the energy balances developed by the Georgian Institute for Statistics, the Mm, the share covered by domestic sources was about one-fifth uh, of the total primary energy supply. Uh, interestingly enough, you can see when you look at the share right, mm, by source, you can see that commonly, uh, as it happens uh, probably around uh, all, all over the world, the most, most of the um, energy uh, consumed by the country comes from fossil fuels. Uh, in the case of Georgia, the amount, the share of fossil fuels is about uh, uh, 76 percent, uh, 76 to 80 percent, depending on the years. But uh, what is interesting, uh, particularly, is that there is still a 20 percent of uh, of domestic generation, and this comes 95 percent from renewables. So. Between the positive and negative uh, aspects of, of what we see here, we can see that domestic uh, domestic production of energy is coming mostly from renewable resources, and uh, while uh, the the imports are basically ninety six percent for fossil fuels. So the country is, is by now you have guessed is not uh, and well endowed with fossil fuels. But as I was mentioning, it is mountainous, it is an abundance of rivers and of, uh, of um, water resources. It has also a very good exposure to, to sun and wind, and we will see the implication. So what this implies is uh, a very interesting um, opportunity that comes from energy transition, right? Uh, the country, by transiting out uh, away from fossil fuel dependency, is going to increase its energy security because basically developing renewables means uh, reducing dependency from imported energy. Uh, at the same time, developing renewables can, can become an interesting way to, to boost exports uh, as uh, basically all countries are, are transitioning towards the renewables, a country that can provide clean energy, energy generated by renewables can help other countries as well. Of course, first take into account, of course, its internal needs. And uh, other potential gains, of course, moving away from these fossil fuels could definitely lead to health and environmental gains. So a lot of gains from energy transition potential for the country. Uh, so in this context, you can see the government goals are somehow matching this uh, and, and share this view. So, and they say, in fact, uh, the government of Georgia has set uh, an objective of uh, uh, increasing the share of, of renewable energy sources covering basically contributed to PES uh, from 20%, 20.5%, which it was in 2019, 35% by 2030. At the same time, another commitment of the Georgian government is towards the reduction of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission um, by 35% compared to the 1990 levels by 2030. So is there a potential for this energy transition, right? So we were saying, well, if we develop domestic uh, energy um, production, then we will be um, achieving basically these goals 
of improving energy security and at the same time reducing the carbon footprint of the country mm, together. Well, there is a, an abundance of uh, renewable energy sources and there is a growing government attention to develop such uh, resources. The hydropower potential is the one that currently is being mostly uh, utilized. Potential of 50 terawatt hour per year. Again, currently the capacity installed is amounting to about 22% of what is estimated to be the potential installed capacity. Wind, there is a total production potential estimated of about four terawatt hour per year, of which only less, uh, less than 2% is currently uh, installed. Solar is basically not, has basically no installed capacity, except in limited form by private for housing. Uh, and it also has a potential estimated uh, amount of that is significant, it's one terawatt hour. Plus biomass with also a, an achievable potential about three, four terawatt hour per year, currently utilized about 0.1% and typically in the form of uh, wood burned into, uh, by, by, by Georgian households. There is also a good potential for geothermal. So, the potential for the energy transition is actually quite good. Lots of renewables that could be developed. However, what the figures that I showed you now show is, is that in reality, this potential is way underutilized. And so why is it so? Um, it, 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 it is a question that, that uh, arises also as this, um, as, as the path toward the energy transition being consistent and positive, well, what we see when we look at the energy needs of the country and how domestic production, which basically remains renewables, have been uh, production capacity has been developing over, over time. You see that in the last seven years, while the demand has been steadily increasing, the capacity of, of uh, renewables to cover it and of domestic resources coverage has actually declined. So the share and the total amount of renewables has been declining. And this, when, when we look at domestic sources development over time, um, is, uh, appears more clearly. So hydropower uh, has been the renewable resource that has been developed. Uh, the most during the last seven years with ups and downs. Uh, but a big decline has been observed in, in the biofuel and waste component or contribution, which is again, biofuel and waste is um, correctly um, inputted as a renewable. Uh, the issue was and, and still is that the big endowment in terms of forests of the country um, has been uh, hit by overconsumption beyond its uh, capacity to renew itself. So a, a better uh, and sustainable management of forests is, is a key priority that is, of course, being taken by the government of Georgia. But so the high levels of contribution of 2013 and even before were not sustainable. So we can expect uh, the, the contribution of biofuel and waste to stabilize at a level much closer to where we are now, rather than going back to the 2013 levels and before. Mm, there is a slight increase that you can see uh, from, from the bottom in, uh, in geothermal, solar and energy, which is again, still extremely limited. So the main hope for the future is for the development of uh, geothermal, solar, wind energy, which are is way underdeveloped in the country. So, as we said, let me get back a moment. Remember, the government wants to increase the share of total primary energy supply coming from covered by renewable energy sources domestically produced from 20.5 to 35 percent. So. This requires a big reversal of these trends, right? Okay, we already know that probably we cannot in the short term reverse 
the, the trend in biofuel and waste. So what it means is that hydro geothermal solar and wind will have to increase. While they have not been increasing that steeply or that quickly over the last seven years. So the first question that comes to mind is why has it happened and what is being done to, to reverse this trend or basically to, to boost the increase in, in, in production from renewables in the country. The first thing is looking at what are the obstacles. So let's identify uh, the obstacles to energy transition. And I try to map here the, the results of a recent discussion uh, that were, uh, was um, held to, to really talk about the development of renewables and, and uh, possible action and existing constraints. Um, it was a, a working group that was put together um, with the cooperation of uh, um, the United Nations um, Organization for the um, Economic uh, Development in, in uh, European countries. And it was focusing on renewables and with the cooperation of RAN21, right, which you probably know as this very important international um, organization that really monitors uh, and promotes the development of renewables. So I tried to map it, um, what, what came out of this discussion, um, starting from actors, right, that are key actors in the energy transition, uh, the government, of course, of Georgia, consumers, uh, where we could also uh, include, uh, to some extent, also the, the, the civil societies and, and NGOs, but then you have the media and information environment and potential investors on renewables. So at the first step, okay, we can look at the government in the past in Georgia has had a, a relatively top-down approach towards energy transition uh, with uh, difficulties in, in sharing um, information with the public, civil society, NGOs, and uh, limited transparency and inclusiveness in the process of developing the plans and uh, and, and the strategies in this area, including uh, providing data about the assessment of projects that were going to be developed or that had been developed in terms of ex ante, ex post assessment. This has led, this has led uh, um, together with the poor uh, information coming from the media uh, and actually active disinformation efforts uh, sometimes uh, to confusions among the, the consumers and in the society, limited perception about what are the real energy security risks of the country, and an underestimation of benefits and overestimation of costs associated with the, the development of, of local generation and of local um, energy production. And this uh, limited perception about the, the costs of inaction, but also uh, and limited willingness to pay to change basically has also led to uh, opposition to new projects with this attitude that is also known in, to, to a large extent also in Western countries with this not in my backyard, right? So, okay, yeah, maybe we could benefit from having extra generation, uh, extra renewables mm, mm, energy production, but not in this municipality, not in this province, not in this region, not in. And so this has been hampering. This, uh, this attitude has been strengthened by other, uh, by other um, issues. The fact, for example, that the government has tried to keep low uh, the, the cost of energy, also uh, among others for social issues, other times for political issues, but this has led to policies that have not really uh, helped, right? Strengthening incentives for uh, and providing incentives for the realization of new uh, projects uh, related to renewables. So there were subsidies to fossil fuels to keep, because part of the energy, of course, uh, as we saw, large part of the uh, of the energy comes from fossil fuels, which are imported, but 
there are uh, there is a significant part of electricity generated by thermal power plants when hydropower generation is low. Residential consumption of gas has been encouraged as a way to move away from, from wood consumption, which has positive aspects on one side, because again, in terms of health, in terms of quality of energy available to, to households is an improvement, but it comes at a cost because it's not renewables, it is important. And, and the government has tried to help in a way Uh, to some extent subsidizing HPPs, but only in specific uh, instances. And uh, it, this ensemble of trying to keep prices of energy low through subsidies uh, or through tariffs um, approaches basically has led, has further strengthened the, the opposition to in, investment in renewables and in investments in energy transition, so moving away from fossil fuels. It has helped downplaying, in a way, right, the, the, the need of such transition and the potential benefits from such transition. Mm, so any reform is now associated with the, the fear of increase in energy prices, which of course is not very popular uh, among, among consumers. So, Having distorted market signals, limited transparency has also been uh, uh, creating hurdles in um, when, when the investors, but also financial institutions supposed to fund investment in renewables had to evaluate the potential costs and benefits of such, um, such uh, projects and made it harder to get funded, right? The prices are not giving proper signals. Other data are scarcely available. This has definitely increased uncertainty. And other uh, a third, a third branch uh, that has not been helping in developing renewable resources has been the fact that the, the infrastructure is uh, in many instances not yet fully updated, like we are speaking of transmission lines, we are speaking of, um, because it's necessary many times to move, right? A big flows of, um, especially electricity across the country, as the most of the generation is on the Western part, while most of the consumption is on the Eastern part. And also to, the, in general, the quality of the grid needs to be upgraded, it needs to become smarter, in order to allow a better incorporation of renewables into it. But the limited budget of the government, which is made worse by the fact that part of it is spent on subsidies, is uh, has led to delays into that. So you put together sometimes the opposition of, of the population to the development of renewable projects, the difficulties in getting funding, the difficulties in assessing properly the uncertainty and the risks, on the, on the investor side, and the fact that this is amplified by the existence of this old infrastructure, all of this has been seen as a, a complex setup leading to insufficient new investment and to lower than planned, in systematically lower than planned installed capacity uh, in, in, in associated with all the renewables that would actually be the key stepping stone together with an increase in energy efficiency, which I didn't pay a lot of attention to, but that is also another in key, key aspect, which I will not be focusing on. Um, these two aspects uh, have, have, uh, have been lagging behind. So the way forward, we can be relatively positive, I would say, about, about the steps being taken by the Georgian government uh, to, to push and, and to overcome these challenges and bypass and basically remove these constraints, uh, it, it will take work. But I think the direction uh, and the emphasis is right at the moment. So the Georgian government is currently working on a comprehensive strategic document to define its energy transition path, which is this National Integrated Energy and Climate Plan of Georgia. It, the document has already been developed in a draft form by the experts of, of the ministries of environment and of 
economy and uh, is now being uh, shared and discussed with uh, a working group of uh, above 80 representatives um, or from uh, civil society, uh, from, um, in, from uh, industrial sectors, uh, including again also NGOs. And, and this is a, already a sign that there is an effort to increase transparency and inclusiveness. Um, this integrated uh, plan is actually covering several areas from electricity and gas market liberalization, which should help um, moving away from uh, uh, more regulated pricing towards a more uh, prices that are signaling much uh, more correctly what is the situation into the energy market. Um, there are investments in infrastructure being planned about this network uh, that, that we were mentioning. Mm, there are investments that are going to, uh, that are focusing on uh, increasing energy efficiency across the board in the country, measures to support the development of renewable energy sources, and on the side of a greenhouse uh, gas emissions, strict emission targets on key sectors, which also will be prompting, right? Uh, and will be contributing to push for the drive for um, towards uh, increasing energy efficiency, but also shifts away from fossil fuels because these key em these emission targets will be um, will be basically pushing the productive sectors away from uh, um, fossil fuel that lead to, to higher emissions. Um, so all of these basically, and the, and the fact that this is all put in a document that is basically trying to have a, a holistic view, I think is also a, a very positive sign. If you remember, I mentioned that one, one, key, uh, one key constraint was related to consumer and society attitude toward these efforts and, and, and the link to the state of poor state of information and media um, background and environment, um, there is an effort ongoing. Actually, there are multiple efforts ongoing to train media and help diffusion of information. Some are really at the government level with, for example, the, the regulator of the energy and water sector, GINERC, um, that and its own research and education center to help uh, train and, and build the, the understanding among media people uh, about the challenges and about uh, the, the actions that have been taken. But there are also several other initiatives uh, brought forward uh, with the support of several international donors to, to, to increase this awareness and, and to, to help providing more information and, and better quality um, information. So, in all of these positive aspects that I see, again, the positive development, I see the, the one of the main challenges that has been arising in the last years has been, okay, together with COVID, the fact that the political situation in the country uh, has become very tense. And so it has taken away part of the focus from energy transition, and again, due to the, to the, the significant political uncertainty uncertainty and turmoil um, related to elections and related to the relation, uneasy relation between the, the government and the opposition. So this is, of course, a challenge that is, uh, is also not, not uh, minor and not to be underestimated. So this concludes the picture uh, about the situation in, in Georgia. And of course, I'm available to, to discuss uh, any questions and to answer any questions that you want. Thank you very much, Roberto. So, Eugenia, please. Um, good morning, dear colleagues, and uh, thank you for this opportunity um, to present our work on the topic, economic aspects of environmental issues in Belarus. And this presentation is based uh, on the research findings by Irina Tachitska and by myself. And the brief overview of the environmental performance of Belarus in the global context can be drawn uh, from the Environmental Performance Index, 
calculated by Yale uh, Center for Environmental Law and Policy. And the 2020 Environmental Performance Index um, assesses 180 countries uh, across 32 performance indicators on environmental health and ecosystems vitality. And the rank uh, you can see inside the uh, parentheses near the name of the countries. So here are some <laughs> of the countries are presented. And um, in 2020, Belarus was ranked uh, 49th uh, with a score of 53, taking the first place among the countries belonging to the Commonwealth of Independent States. At the same time, um, if we look at the current trends in greenhouse gases emissions, the situation may not seem uh, that optimistic. Um, in 1990, 1995, the sharp decrease of greenhouse gases emissions uh, was due to the economic crisis after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, but since 1995, uh, the economy of Belarus has started to grow and with it also uh, greenhouse gases emissions. And in 2019, against 1995, the growth of CO2 emissions uh, was 6.1%, the growth of methane emissions um, was 8.5%, and the growth of uh, nitrous oxide emissions um, was 16.7%. And although the ratio of aggregated greenhouse emissions to GDP in purchasing power standards in 2019 against 1995 decreased almost three times, it's still quite difficult to talk about the decoupling of economic growth in Belarus and the increase in emissions. And one more thing to mention here um, is that the recently updated national, nationally determined contributions of Belarus to, cli uh, to combat climate change uh, now make up, uh, makes up 35% reduction in greenhouse gases emissions in 2030 against uh, the level of 1990. <laughs> without taking into account um, any additional conditions. And uh, the reduction about 40% uh, if there are such conditions like, for example, uh, participation in the, like having the international uh, uh, financial mechanisms. And um, nowadays, the international trade is going uh, more and more into a climate dimension. And it's not only because of a rise in demand for ecological products, but, um, because climate policies are becoming more and more prioritized, not only in developed, but also in developing countries. And these climate policies are affecting uh, international trade. And one of the examples of these climate policies is uh, the introduction of the carbon border adjustment mechanism by the European Union as part of the uh, European Green Deal. And the objective of this mechanism is to address uh, the risk of carbon leakage by ensuring that the price of inputs will reflect the carbon uh, content. And the payments for carbon intensive products imported to the European Union will start uh, from 2026 under this mechanism for some, group of, uh, for some group of goods. And according to the European Commission, Belarus is actually uh, among the top five potentially most exposed countries to the um, carbon border adjustment mechanism. And in this regard, um, the, objecti the objectives of the current study were to estimate the carbon intensity of the main Belarusian industries for 2019, to assess the carbon footprint of domestic consumption and exports, and to evaluate potentially possible payments for exported Belarusian products falling within the scope of the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. And in this study, um, Emission, emissions intensity is used uh, in the meaning of embodied emissions. It means direct and indirect emissions produced by a product or service across uh, its whole value chain per one monetary uh, unit of a product or a service. And we have, uh, we have conducted environmentally extended input-output analysis to calculate the emissions intensity of the uh, Belarusian economy for 2019 under three scenarios. In the first one, only CO2 emissions were taken into consideration. In the second one, uh, CO2 and nitrous oxide emissions were accounted for. And in the third one, um, as you can see, CO2, nitrous oxide, and methane emissions were taken into account. 
And the graph shows uh, top 10 industries under each of the scenarios with the highest emissions intensity in terms of uh, CO2 equivalents per 1,000 uh, US dollars of output. And of course, we can see that the order of the industries changes depending on the scenarios, uh, but power supply, non-metallic mineral products, um, sewage water processing, water supply and agriculture take uh, the leading positions in all the scenarios. And um, to compare the carbon footprint of domestic consumption and gross exports for Belarus with other countries, uh, we have used uh, the database of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And um, at the same time, this comparison uh, should be, is for information purposes and should be taken uh, with caution because the indicators for Belarus, we calculated for 2019. And the indicators for other countries were available in the database, in this database only for 2015. And um, besides the carbon footprint of domestic consumption for Belarus um, does not include the emissions from import. Um, so we can interpret it as a lower boundary of the true value. And uh, for this comparison, only CO2 emissions uh, were taken into account. And as we can see, uh, the carbon footprint of domestic consumption per capita in Belarus, uh, for Belarus, is comparable with uh, Hungary and neighboring countries like Lithuania and Latvia. Uh, at the same time, Czech Republic, Estonia, and Germany, for example, surpass Belarus uh, by this indicator. And this situation shows us two important uh, issues. Uh, one is that more, more efficient technologies and advanced ecological uh, legislation typical for the countries of the European Union alone cannot handle all the environmental issues and um, the change of the behavior of the population is also necessary. And the population of the European Union uh, on the whole has a higher income level than citizens in Belarus and that enables them not only to buy a um, uh, more diverse choice of goods, but also uh, a larger number of goods, which is actually reflected in the carbon footprint of domestic consumption. And um, another issue is that uh, eco ecological norms and standards in the European Union um, that regulate producers uh, cost to transfer carbon intensive manufacturing to countries where there is no stringent environmental regulation. And, uh, but on the, on the global level, this does not solve uh, the problem of um, greenhouse gases emissions, uh, but leads to the input of carbon intensive goods to the European Union. That's why carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, is developed. And if we uh, look at the carbon footprint of gross exports uh, for Belarus and for other countries, uh, we can see that for Belarus, this indicator is uh, quite close to Hungary but surpasses uh, Lithuania, uh, Latvia, Estonia, and Sweden. And this is not only due to technological characteristics of production in different countries, but also due to variations in export commodity uh, structure. But at the same time, this indicator uh, gives us the first impression to what extent the economy of Belarus can be vulnerable to different limitations introduced by countries to reduce um, carbon content of imported goods. And as climate policies in international um, uh, trade, first of all, affect uh, goods from the manufacturing sector, it is worth uh, looking at the carbon intensity of this sector in particular. And on the graphs, um, we can see uh, top 10 manufacturing industries by emissions intensity in terms of CO2 equivalents per 1,000 uh, US dollars of output. Um, and uh, we can see that uh, non-metallic mineral products take uh, the first place in all the scenarios. Uh, but what else can we conclude from this analysis is that taking into account nitrous oxide emissions does not change much the carbon intensity in the majority of the industries in the manufacturing sector, except for food products. Uh, here, nitrous oxide emissions embodied in the value chain uh, make up more than 50% of the uh, carbon intensity. And when considering the third scenario and accounting also for methane emissions, uh, we can see that they add up a substantial um, share in the carbon intensity of, again, food products, but also uh, metallurgical production. 
And as a next step for our analysis, uh, we would like to estimate payments for Belarus when the carbon border adjustment mechanism will be introduced. Uh, but as this mechanism now is still in the very initial stage of its development and encompasses a large number of open methodological questions, it's not uh, possible to estimate the pay, pay based on our analysis of carbon intensity of different industries and uh, the carbon footprint of its export, uh, we managed to evaluate potentially possible uh, payments. And uh, for that, actually, um, we used combined nomenclature codes and the respected, uh, respective foreign economic activity commodity nomenclature and brought them into correspondence to the codes in the input output tables to define the share of goods falling under the scope of the carbon border adjustment mechanism in the export of, uh, of an industry. And after that, the carbon footprint of experts um, by a given industry was multiplied by the share of goods falling under the scope of the carbon border adjustment mechanism in the total export of this industry to the European Union. And finally, multiplied uh, by the current price of carb carbon in the um, European emission trading scheme. And so um, in the first column, you can see the categories of goods falling within the scope of carbon border adjustment mechanism. And then you can see the footprint from exports of these goods to the European Union and also uh, in also three scenarios and respective payments. And in the first scenario, uh, when we account only for CO2 emissions, the total payments will reach $31.5 million. Uh, in the second one, uh, where nitrous oxide emissions are also accounted for, uh, the payments will make up uh, 34.7 million uh, US dollars. And in the third scenario, when also methane emissions will be taken into account, payments will reach uh, 48.5 million dollars. And to understand how sensitive our expert is to these payments, we can look at the carbon border adjustment mechanism as an equivalent of the introduction of an additional input duty on the uh, exported Belarusian goods to the European Union which is a equal to about 3.4, 3.8% for inorganic chemicals and fertilizers, to about 6.7, 13.7% for metals and uh, their articles, and for around 6.5, uh, 6.6% for mineral products, um, depending on the scenario. And um, when the carbon border adjustment mechanism is introduced, Belarus will also face uh, increased competition uh, at the market of the European Union uh, because the difference in the price of its products and goods uh, produced in the European Union will be decreased. And also, according to expert opinion, after 2026, um, European Commission will add new industries falling under the scope of this mechanism and broaden the number of greenhouse gases, which should be taken into account. And the price for carbon in the European Union will probably uh, uh, grow because the free allocation of, of allowances will decrease. But it's not only about uh, our export to the European Union, uh, but also other countries um, uh, have introduced or plan to introduce already an emissions trading system. And this, the number of countries is increasing. And in order, in this regard, uh, some policies for Belarus could be first to improve the system of emissions monitoring in the country. Second, it's important to develop and implement an emissions trading system. And there have been already discussions for quite a, some time about the introduction of the system as the next step in our environmental policy, but it's still not there. And third, it's important to stimulate enterprises to implement cleaner technologies and measures designed to uh, decrease their emissions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, so we're actually already out of time. So there's not a lot of sort of room for Q&A at this particular point, but just to try to wrap up a little bit perhaps uh, the conversation we had in this particular panel then, I mean, I think it well illustrated from different countries within the region, both some of the kind of opportunities that are there and also some of the challenges. I mean, Norberto was talking about the potential for renewable energy production in Georgia, for instance. I mean, clearly the potential is there. 
I think it's very interesting to hear Bernardes also talk about innovative processes to bring in sort of different segments of the society into the discussion on how to move forward with improving the environment, for instance. I'm looking forward to hear more about that. I can understand in the short run, this may be challenging, but probably hopefully in the longer run, this may prove to be useful for sustainability of this. But it also, of course, the discussion has pointed to some of the challenges involved as well. So, I mean, how do we get the kind of prices right? I mean, when we're talking about fossil fuel production, we're talking about negative externalities, but instead in reality, in many countries in Eastern Europe, but also in other parts of the world, we actually subsidize fossil fuel production, which doesn't make a lot of sense, obviously. Uh, it's also a question about overcoming the kind of political logic of short-sightedness and, and populism and in, reality in order to sort of give incentives for firms and investors to invest in new energy and so on, you need long-term commitments to realistic plans in that direction. And it's of course also a sort of a challenge in terms of educating people about the needs to reform. When it comes to carbon border adjustment mechanism, I think the discussion here also illustrated a little bit the pros and cons of that. I mean, in one way, of course, it's about getting the incentives rights uh, and also to, in a sense, open up the opportunity within the European Union to move forward with more progressive policies without being sort of having too much of a challenge in terms of, of uh, uh, potential sort of imports and so on from other countries. But on the other hand, of course, as the sort of discussion by Maxim now in terms of Ukraine, it is also potentially an economic challenge for vulnerable, vulnerable economies in Eastern Europe as well. Uh, but with that, I'll close this section and we Indeed. have... Uh, I would like to discuss, uh, well, effectively, I would like to talk about the climate opinions and the formal title of my talk today is Green Concerns and Silence, Silence of Environmental Issues in Eastern Europe. And uh, It's based on work with Chloe Lecoq, who uh, you are going to listen to later on today. So basically... Uh, where would I start? Uh, we, are, we are all aware of climate change being one of the main concern, concerns uh, globally at the moment. And I think a quite popular view is that large organizations, large businesses, governments need to uh, undertake some important and fast actions to combat climate change. However, when it comes to the assessment of potential effects of individual actions, then there is less agreement uh, well, both in the literature and the public debate. So, uh, because people sometimes say, well, okay, uh, it's very difficult to mobilize individual actors. And even if you do, the effect is likely to be very small. However, uh, recent research proves that this is, this is a misconception. To start with, uh, roughly 70, just above 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions, they come from household or lifestyle consumption such as mobility, diet, housing, and so on and so forth. Moreover, a recent research tried to assess the uh, extent to which changes in individual behavior can, can alter our situation with climate change. And if you think about it, uh, it, can, it can go in, uh, well, in multiple ways. So you can also have, you can have not only direct effect on environment, but you can also have an effect through change in societal norms, through induced change in policies. So in principle, it's important. And very recent paper by Maran and co-authors from 2020 uh, actually assessed the macroeconomic impact of changes in consumer behavior. So what they looked at is they, they looked at the changes that, which are already in practice. So not something hypothetical, but something that people actually employ. And what they, uh, what they found is that if you manage to convince uh, more of the population to, to, to use, uh, well, to use the same practices to introduce changes in, in their individual behavior, it may actually uh, result in no less as, uh, than 25% reduction in carbon footprint in the EU, which is a very sizable number. Uh, however, uh, probably the main prerequisite, or at least one of the main prerequisites in, uh, for changes in uh, individual behavior as concerns climate change is the awareness of individuals uh, that there is a threat, a threat of climate change. And it's again shown in the literature. However, when it comes to data, what we are, I guess, many of us are well aware of is that uh, there is significant public ignorance when it comes to the uh, understanding of the impact of climate change. 
And here you can see a graph that I adopted from uh, the research by PEW Center fr uh, from 2015 that basically uh, plots percent of population saying that global climate change is a very serious problem. And you can see that countries that are producing quite well, most of the uh, global CO2 emissions are also those where population is not very, very concerned about climate, climate change. You can see China, you can see Russia, well, also in the United States. So in essence, people are, don't seem to be very knowledgeable, at least in these countries. And this lack of awareness is not very well in, uh, understood. And basically what I'm going to talk about today is uh, also related to, uh, to this topic, but with a slightly more narrow focus. So what I'm going to discuss is how the public opinions about climate uh, change risk uh, look like in Eastern Europe. So I will start by comparing the climate change risk perception uh, between three regions of Europe. So I will look at the Western Europe, I will look at the Eastern European states that are part of the EU, and I will compare it to the Eastern European countries that are outside of the EU. And then uh, I will show you that there is a difference that the uh, non-EU Eastern European countries are really lagging behind, and I will try to identify the factors that are driving this difference. And I will do it using the data for, from recent uh, survey on uh, different opinions, including climate opinions by Lloyd Register Foundation. And just in case I will, uh, I will be short in time, let me try to tell you where I'm leading. So uh, I will, as I already mentioned, tell you, show you that non-EU non Eastern European states are least concerned uh, about the climate change among these three groups. And this result stands even if we control for non-determinants of climate change opinion. And what I will try to argue today is that at least part of this difference is basically due to uh, the issues of environmental uh, uh, concerns and of climate change having very low salience and informativeness when it comes to the public discussion in this region. And to uh, support my point, I will show you the, uh, how the impact, personal impact of extreme weather events uh, sorry, how the personal experience of extreme weather events affects climate change opinion in these three regions of Europe. And I will show you that there is the strongest change, the strongest learning about the uh, well, risks of climate change uh, coming from the personal experience, again, happens in the non-EU Eastern European countries. And basically, my logic will be that people that are more aware of climate change, they probably learn less from their personal risks. And when are people more aware of climate change? When the public message about climate change is clearer. Okay, so this is more or less the structure of my previous presentation. Okay, let me start with the short summary of how the uh, green concerns look across these three European regions. So you can see here in the graph, so uh, the leftmost part is Western Europe, the part in the middle is Eastern European countries that are part of the EU. And then the uh, right part is the Eastern European countries that are outside of the EU. And the blue bar uh, denotes the percentage of, of uh, respondents of the survey that I mentioned above that said that uh, climate change is, uh, well, they consider climate change to be a very serious threat. The orange bar is the percentage of people who consider it to be somewhat serious, right? Okay, and then you also have the lines that represent uh, region averages. And you can see that there are least concern in Eastern Europe and most concern in Western Europe, even though in each of the regions there is, some, there is a substantial variation. And I have to say, I, I'm not aware of much research covering the non-EU Eastern Europe in this dimension. However, there has been significant research do, uh, uh, looking into, into the climate concerns of the EU part in Eastern Europe. So people are aware of as the Western part. And uh, there, are, there is a number of explanations that literature is bringing up, such as historical reliance on coal and other fossil fuels. And also uh, this region having relatively lower income than the Western part and also some other immediate problems that may basically make lower the priority of climate related problems. Uh, 
there is also wide literature that links climate beliefs to a number of socioeconomic characteristics of respondents, such as gender, level of education, income, and so on and so forth. And potentially, this, this socioeconomic characteristics can also be different across the regions, which may contribute to the differences in beliefs. So, well, basically, what we are trying to do, we are trying to test for, for well, all these explanations to the extent possible, meaning we are restricted by the data. So we, we take into account the socioeconomic characteristics that we have, such as I already mentioned, gender, education, income group, uh, well, number of uh, people in the household and so on and so forth. Plus we also try to control for the uh, income level of the country in question from the for the reliance uh, on oil, gas, or coal. And we also control for exposure to CO2 emissions and the clean uh, uh, to, to the uh, other measures of the emissions. And as a result, what we see is even after we control for all these factors, we still have the regional differences. So this graph depicts the predicted probability of answer climate change is a very serious threat across three regions. And again, you see it's the highest in Western Europe and the lowest in non-Eastern Europe, non-EU Eastern Europe. So our next step is how, what are the other determinants of the uh, climate change opinion that can help us explain this difference? And one suggestion that I already outlined is to see if the personal ex experience of extreme weather events may change people's opinion uh, in terms of the risks of climate change. And if the extent of the change in opinion differs across the regions. Okay, so uh, in the questionnaire that I mentioned, there is also a question about people having recent experience of extreme weather event. And we look at this question and we assess how does the experience of past extreme weather events change individual perception of risks associated with climate change. And we control for everything that I mentioned uh, in the previous slide. And we also control for the country, which basically means that we compare people that faced extreme weather events to their compatriots, people from the same country that did not face extreme weather events. And what we see, and you can see it from the graph, is that uh, extreme weather events have the strongest impact uh, in terms of increasing the level of climate concern in non-EU Eastern Europe, and the softest one in Western Europe, okay? And our interpretation of this uh, finding is that maybe this is one potential channel, uh, maybe people in Western Europe are more aware, generally speaking, of climate change risks, and when they face extreme weather events, they don't update their beliefs that much because this doesn't come to them as a shock. And in order to test this logic, we uh, undertake two more exercises. So we are trying to relate uh, the learning from exp personal experience of extreme weather events to the quality of media with the idea that better media, more independent media, media that have a better quality of message may imply people being more aware about climate risks and thus learning less about the risks of climate change from personal experience. And indeed, as you can see from, from this graph, so uh, what this graph depicts is the marginal effect of faith, having an experience of, cross, uh, uh, of extreme weather event for different qualities of media, where uh, this is an independence media. Uh, index, with zero being the least independent media and four being the, uh, the best independent media. And you can see that people that live in countries with least independent me media learn much more or update their beliefs in terms of how important is the climate change, how high is the risk, much more from the personal experience that pe than people that live in countries with uh, high quality media. Uh, similarly, kind of in the same vein of uh, logic, uh, we, uh, 
try to relate the personal experience of extreme weather events to climate-related legislative effort. With the same idea that climate laws may basically uh, depict, they can be an indicator of how important the issue of climate change is uh, in the well public discussion in this country. And then if this, this is a common part of public discussion, then again, uh, individuals are probably more aware of climate change risks and less surprised when they face uh, extreme weather events or less, less likely to learn from this in terms of their preferences towards climate change. And what you see on this graph is here you have a cumulative number of climate re related laws adopted uh, by in the country, I think by 2018. And I just took some numbers, it does, it ranges from five to, uh, well, it, the range of laws is much larger, but uh, just for illustration, I took, uh, well, a few numbers and I uh, assess the marginal effect of gaining experience for countries with different number of climate related laws. And you see, again, the more climate re related legislation there is in a country, the less personal experience is changing the climate, uh, climate uh, risks opinion of, a, of an affected individual. Obviously, what I have shown to you is more of a correlations. We cannot really talk about causation here. So for example, in this exercise, it's not quite clear what drives what, right? Because it could be that climate laws uh, affect the personal perception of importance of climate change, but it could also be that climate change perceptions affect the in incentives of the country to undertake uh, climate-related legislation. However, just to sum up, to wrap up this discussion, uh, what I have shown to you so far is that while there is a difference in climate concerns across different parts of Europe, and in particular, climate concerns in non-European part of Eastern, non-EU part of Eastern Europe are lagging behind uh, concerns uh, within the EU. And one particular driver of this on top of everything else that have been, that we discussed today could be personal experience. And indeed, while the literature is inconclusive about the effects of personal experience, for this data, we find that personal experiences raises awareness of climate change risks, and especially so in the non-EU part of Eastern Europe. And our preferred explanation is that this is because uh, in non-EU part of Eastern Europe, the uh, public discussion or the level of information uh, about the climate change risks provided uh, to the population is relatively low. And this is why people learn much more from their personal experience, which basically uh, I think uh, offers an obvious policy recommendation. Given that climate concern is a very important issue, it looks like we do need significant involvement of both governments in these regions, and obviously civil society, and maybe not only in this region, to improve the quality of information and to mobilize population so that we can all fight against the climate change. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, again, I want to remind everybody in the audience and panelists that you can use the Q&A function and the chat function if you're a panelist for, for questions you have. But I have, uh, I have just a, a couple of questions to you, maybe, if you, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, first of all, I, I think that the sort of there's a bit of a generational divide, perhaps, in terms of these perceptions. And I'm wondering if you have age variation in your data, if you have looked at if the divide between the different countries is the similar even if you confine yourself to the younger parts of the population. Uh, first question. And the second question, I can take it right away, is I'm thinking about the distinction between media coverage and the perceptions about political engagement in the issue. In, in a sense, I think in many cases it goes hand in hand, but I mean, one thing that maybe stuck out for some people yeah, that actually in Sweden, the concern is relatively smaller than in many other countries. And one of the arguments that has been brought up is that people read a lot in media about this and are concerned, but they also perceive that the politicians care a lot about these and are trying to do something about it. 
and and with that kind of logic, I can imagine in countries where you know media pays a lot of attention to this, but the perception is that politicians don't really care. Maybe that's where the concerns are the greatest, and and the other way around. If that's if that could be sort of part of the argument as well. Okay, so let me start with your first question because it's kind of easier for me to answer. Yes, we do have the age structure, and we do cut well. Uh, the data they have that I have shown to you is the individual level data. It's not the country level data, and we do control for all observables that we have, including the age. Okay, and I do believe that uh, that should take out any effects of the age that we could potentially uh, that could potentially bias our results. So. To put it differently, my very first graph, whether, where I just presented some statistics in a graphical way for each country, there it could uh, the different patterns of aging uh, in terms of population could definitely contribute to the difference. But in the uh, well regressional analysis that I didn't show you, but I showed you the outcomes, I don't think that would matter. Uh, I don't know if you agree. Uh, no, no, as, no, I think, I think my, my point was a little bit different, not, not so much that I'm worried about the bias of the average results, but more to see if, if we only look at the younger population, maybe the differences across countries are, are smaller, that, that's what I was wondering. Oh yeah, that I, I mean, okay, I did, we, do, we didn't do that, that exercise, but I, I do absolutely buy uh, your intuition. So I would also expect the younger population to be much more convergent in, the, in, in this sense. In, I cannot tell you because I didn't do the exercise if there is full convergence. Uh, my expectation, but it's an un uneducated expectation, I would expect full convergence within the EU, meaning the Eastern European part of EU and Western part of EU. I think the uh, younger generation would probably have comparable opinions. But as for the non-EU part, maybe there will be still some luck, but much smaller than for the older generation. So I'm, I'm fully with you on this, on, on, on that point. When it comes to your second point, I completely agree. Unfortunately, uh, it wasn't really possible for us to do this exercise due to the lack of data. But indeed, I mean, it's not really clear how the um, climate opinions are sh uh, shaped and to which extent they trust to the society, trust, trust to the actors, the governmental actors of the society affects the uh, climate concerns. Right, because this is partly what you have been talking about, but maybe to, to a sl slightly different uh, dimension. I, and I would very much be interested to, to learn more about it, but at the moment, I'm not aware of, of data that would uh, answer this question. Thank you very much, Elena. Very interesting. Uh, with that, uh, Pavel, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good uh, afternoon. I'm very glad to be today uh, with you. It's a pleasure to uh, have a chance to present uh, a topic which combine two of angles which are close to my heart. One is a Polish uh, energy sector transition and the second is a as a EU uh, policy framework uh, mainly on energy and uh, climate. Uh, I have a slides prepared for, for today. I will try to present it now. So just uh, if you could confirm that uh, all is okay with that. Can you see the, the first slide? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So uh, I will speak about uh, about the European Green Deal and how how does it accelerate the transition of the Polish uh, energy sector. I'm representing uh, BalticWinds.eu uh, platform, uh, which is uh, freshly new uh, initiative platform for uh, for networking and news uh, dedicated to. Uh, offshore wind development in the Baltic uh, Sea region. However, I would not focus only on the on the wind uh, development in Poland and, and its chances, but I would uh, be happy to present the entire scope of, of the transition and how does it fit with um, uh, to, to the uh, European uh, policy framework. Mm. 
So I will start with, uh, with presenting shortly state of play of the transition of energy sector in Poland. What are challenges I had? Uh, the first slide I, I decided to uh, present the most sensitive issue, especially uh, as we are during uh, winter uh, time, uh, and the smoke and uh, poor air quality in Poland is one of the most uh, highly on the agenda, political agenda and energy transition uh, agenda issue. Mm, yeah, this is. Uh, as you can see on the map, uh, a huge problem of uh, country which I know best. Uh, one of the biggest challenges, it causes uh, each year uh, more than 40,000 premature death, uh, deaths, uh, which is more than, than, uh, than was caused by uh, pandemic of COVID last year. So it shows how serious is the problem. This is mainly of a high concentration of dust and smoke uh, um, caused by, uh, in particular, individual uh, heating, uh, which is the main source of, uh, of smoke. Uh, so it's extremely important when we talk these days about Polish energy uh, sector transition. Um, Going into more horizontal uh, approach, uh, I would like to present a few figures and uh, present some conclusions. What uh, what comes what comes from from those figures? Uh, first of all, as you can see, uh, the energy supply in Poland uh, is still dominated by fossil fuels, mainly by by coal. However, its share is decreasing constantly. Uh, the share of natural gas and oil uh, are slowly increasing. Uh, and there is also a marginal role still of renewables, which is, however, still uh, growing. And Poland is one of not so many countries in the EU uh, where there are no uh, nuclear, which is important case. Uh, when it comes to, to the uh, emissions of uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, energy production uh, is decreasing over the last 20 years. It, it's uh, substantially uh, decreased, uh, while at the same time consumption uh, increased. Uh, the what is the role of, of different sources? Coal production and consumption are decreasing slowly, but decreasing. Uh, renewables, both production and consumption are uh, contra on the contrary, are increasing. Uh, the oil uh, and petrol petroleum products, as well as natural gas, uh, are increased uh, when it comes to the consumption. Uh, what is interesting that Poland is among top importers of energy sources in the EU. Uh, uh, however, at the same time, uh, security of supply and energy security is one of the um, uh, most important issue for, for the uh, Polish, Polish energy discussion. And it, it is on a very high uh, top uh, position on uh, during the debates about the um, energy sector, in particular power, uh, power sector in Poland and its uh, modernization. As you can see, uh, there is a huge rate of import dependency when it comes to oil uh, and natural gas, and even on uh, hard coal. Poland is uh, among importers. Importers. Uh, how does it um, uh, happening over last uh, years? When we uh, when we see uh, different sources, uh, Poland is on the second 
place in the EU when it comes to the solid fossil fuels as a uh, top importer. Uh, on the seventh position when it comes to oil and petrolo petroleum uh, products. And in case of natural gas and electricity, in both cases on the, the position eight. Uh, going into the, the, the power sector, uh, installed capacity of electricity uh, is growing over uh, over the last uh, 20 years, mainly renewables, onshore wind and uh, PVs, and photovoltaics. Uh, also generation is growing, uh, in this case mainly from natural gas and renewables. At the same time, Polish power sector uh, unfortunately keeps its, its uh, position as a top uh, carbon intensive in the EU. Uh, of course, it has a uh, huge consequences uh, bearing in mind the need to uh, the need to uh, the need coming from the uh, EU ETS system uh, with uh, evolution of of and, and growing um, prices of allowances to emit um, greenhouse gases, uh, which are keeping its 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 highest level uh, during last couple of years. Uh, it's a uh, it's a huge burden for Polish power sector. This one, which based on the, uh, on the hard coal and lignite, uh, of course. It foster and it, it accelerates the transition of, of the power sector. This, this is the only way how to uh, uh, how to deal it in this situation. Um, uh, going into details about the renewables, uh, it's worth flagging that uh, the capacity uh, is growing, uh, mainly growing due to the uh, prosumer installations, uh, photovoltaics, uh, which is uh, now uh, has more than over six gigawatts of installed capacity uh, uh, during last uh, two years. It's uh, it's uh, it's growth from. Uh, uh, around 1.5 gigawatts, uh, which was at the end of uh, 2019. Um, also, the other renewables are, are growing, uh, and this growth is is quite substantial. So this is uh, the main uh, strategic scenario for the uh, power sector. Um, uh, when we see what is the uh, the plan and scenario for 2040, which is quite conservative, uh, it bases on uh, national energy and climate plans, which are prepared by each member states, EU member states, um, uh, as a consequences of energy union governance. Uh, we see that the potential and the plan for uh, for the Polish power sector in, um, uh, is, uh, as you can see on the right side on the on the slide, uh, more than seventeen gigawatts of wind on and offshore, uh, relatively high high part of the offshore wind on the Baltic Sea, uh, sixteen gigawatts of photovoltaics. So. The, a huge change when it comes to the, the first position um, on the uh, power sector mix. Uh, coal will, will uh, still play a significant role, uh, perhaps next high uh, prices of, of uh, uh, CO2 allowances will, will decrease its role, most probably. Uh, however, this conservative scenario shows that 
uh, still uh, more than 13 gigawatts uh, of capacity will be installed on, on coal, hard and lignite. Uh, the role of gas is slowly growing. Uh, there are two new new elements in the chart, which are which is battery and and nuclear. Uh, now I will speak uh, just a few uh, a few information present about something which is uh, which is close to my. Um, uh, uh, my heart and what, what I'm dealing on everyday basis. Uh, it's offshore wind, as most probably some of you know that uh, there has been signed and negotiated together with the administration and broad scope of uh, stakeholders of, uh, of wind industry and uh, representatives of um, regional and local authorities and several um, several other stakeholders so-called offshore wind sector deal which has been signed uh, in September this year in Warsaw it recognized the offshore wind as a st strategic direction uh, for the transition of Polish energy system of Polish power system uh, it shows uh, in more uh, uh, figures which are more ambitious than, uh, than the, uh, the other previous chart I, I uh, presented, that the potential for the Polish offshore wind is over 10 gigawatts, uh, uh, almost six gigawatts are plans to be installed and, and to be ready to provide electricity um, uh, up to 2030. Uh, what's extremely important that it's not only uh, the case of uh, of Polish power sector, but it will it it will it will affect uh, it will affect also the Polish ports, Polish economy, and Polish um, uh, human resources and local uh, via local content, so called local content, which needs to play a substantial role when it comes to the supply chain. Uh, it will have a huge impact on the on the economy on the level of on the national level, but also regional and local. Uh, uh, that's important to flag that uh, Polish potential for the uh, offshore wind uh, and this uh direction of energy transition is uh, coherent with the rest of uh, countries which are in the baltic sea region uh where where uh, the the investments on the huge scale on massive scale uh, are already uh, happening and uh, will be uh, followed by uh, next uh, couple of uh, during a couple of, of decades in all uh, those countries. Uh, so to sum up this part of my presentation, uh, there are few challenges which uh, I would like to, to mention. Uh, the first one is to give an answer how to speed up the transition, uh, how not to fall behind the other EU countries, uh, how to make it in more the, in the most coherent way. Um, uh, at the same time, how to decrease emissions uh, in the way which is the most cost efficient. Uh, extremely important is competitiveness of the economy, and in this case, uh, not only. Uh, resilience and and the issue of uh, keeping the position of industry but also on employment uh, especially uh, bringing in mind the huge employment in the coal sector which needs to be uh, to be uh, to the other uh, potential uh, part of economy 
uh, the smoke and how to increase the air quality, as you can see on one of my first slides, is, is also extremely sensitive issue and extremely important. Uh, security of supply and energy security, um, bearing in mind that, that uh, this factor, this rate of dependency is, uh, is growing. So renewables, uh, wind and, uh, and solar energy is a, is a way how uh, Poland may increase the energy security. And then last but not least, how to make this uh, entire transition in, in the way which is so-called just, uh, which is acceptable for, uh, for different groups, social groups. And, uh, these are a key challenges for the transition of energy sector, in particular power sector in Poland. Uh, how, uh, uh, how does it look from the perspective of the European uh, regulatory framework, uh, mainly European Green Deal? Uh, what's important, uh, it's, uh, there, there is important to, to flag that um, there are a few layers to consider the issue of uh, European, the European Green Deal and how does it affect uh, uh, its member states, European member states and its uh, transition. Uh, from one point, uh, it's good to remember that climate neutrality is a one common goal for both the EU uh, as an entire EU and its member states. However, there are different conditions for transition in different member states. Therefore, EU provides with its regulatory framework and instruments uh, a mixed uh, approach, which based on, uh, from one side, on, I call it tailor-made approach, which takes into account uh, this uh, condition of each particular member state. On the other side, uh, there are instruments and uh, mechanism uh, which are uh, which 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 treats all member states uh, the same way. Uh, therefore, the coherence and cohesion cohesion approach is needed. Uh, more than ever uh, before to, uh, to, to provide uh, the same, the same, uh, the pace of, uh, of, the, of the transition and the same results in the uh, entire European Union. Uh, I will stop talking about Green Deal on the perspective on the next biggest milestone, which is for 2030, where the reduction of uh, GEG is planned to, uh, to, to reach 55%. Uh, uh, that's the goal of, um, of, for the EU to reduce emissions. Uh, it, will be, it will be done uh, mainly by uh, continuation of decarbonization in, uh, and uh, increasing the role of renewables and energy efficiency. Uh, the new very strong element which is uh, um, which is uh, which needs to be considered as a part of this is this uh, package as a huge um, sources of financial uh, resources to uh, which will be streamlined to strengthen the carbonization and energy efficiency uh, projects and uh, deployment of renewables so this will be also the case for uh, for polish transition um, coming back to this division of instruments and these two approaches the mix of approaches uh, which uh, in case of, of Poland is extremely interesting how, uh, how, how we can see 
those two pers from those two perspectives. Uh, uh, one is uh, the perspective of EU-wide instruments, uh, where the flagship one is a EU ETS. Uh, with a common price of uh, of uh, allowances for all member states, no matter uh, no matter uh, the condition of uh, economy, uh, GDP, or any other uh, factors, uh, this is also uh, will be the case of so-called UATS number two, which is designed for transport and buildings sectors. Uh, also, EU targets are common for the entire European Union, or also the, the same cases when it comes to standards of CO2 emissions for cars and vans. Uh, uh, at the same time, this is the second approach, of, which takes into account conditions and, and uh, the state of play of transition in member states as uh, the contribution to EU targets are not on the same, same level. Uh, each member states, including Poland, um, uh, uh, contribute on a different level, levels, bearing in mind their, their potential. Uh, effort sharing regulation uh, shares uh, the targets for GAG reductions uh, for member states, and this is not uh, this is the distribution. This distribution of burdens of pain is not on the same level. Also, there are there are several compensatory mechanisms, uh, like under the UETS, uh, for instance, modernization fund or social climate fund, which is new, uh, newly designed uh, within the package fit fit for fifty five. Uh, which provides uh, much more uh, financial support for those countries which uh, have more to do and they have uh, lower GDP than EU average. Uh, this is also the case of support from the EU budget uh, for the uh, current uh, multi-annual financial perspective. Uh, till 2027, 20, where there is a mainstreaming of uh, almost one third of the budget on climate uh, on climate uh, investments. Uh, therefore, there is a huge potential for uh, coming from the EU budget uh, budget for uh, to support the transition of Polish energy sector. Um, uh, as I said, uh, the contribution of member states to EU-wide targets, uh, the target on renewables and energy efficiency are on the different levels. In case of Poland, uh, current contribution to, to current, uh, currently designed targets is uh, for renewables um, uh, from 21 to 23%. Uh, for the EU target 32. However, uh, the Fit for 55 package uh, proposes to, to increase it uh, till uh, 40%, which means that that Polish contribution, contribution will need to be uh, also increased. Uh, this is also the case of energy efficiency, um, which uh, absolutely, will will uh, will will cause that uh, uh, that uh, projects for renewables deployment, uh, development of uh, of uh, wind and uh, PV projects, we need to be strengthened and um, accelerated. This is also the case of energy efficiency, uh, which now is on the EU level. Uh, set as 32.5%, uh, and Polish contribu contribution is on the level 23%, increase to 36, 39% uh, will uh, affect the 
in increase of contribution from Polish governments to energy efficiency EU uh, targets. Uh, also worth flagging is that uh, EU regulatory framework uh, is, is creates uh, conditions and the, the, the direction with, which, is, which is obvious for all member states uh, from uh, there are no uh, the alternatives uh, to the ones which are strengthened and uh, transferred through the EU regulatory framework, not only on the climate and energy, but also on uh, sustainability financial uh, policy of, of the European Union and this uh, direction towards uh, electrification and sector coupling is obvious and it needs to be fulfilled and realized by by all EU member states including uh, Poland when then when it uh, when the transition is uh, of energy sector uh, is uh, fulfilled uh, well, if you don't mind sorry but uh, we were running a bit short of time so Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I will speed up. I will accelerate uh, <laughs> as, as the transition is accelerated by European Green Deal. And so you accelerate me <laughs> with my presentation. So just to, to show you uh, uh, important elements, uh, of course, of the transition is always how to finance it. There is a, a, a lot of uh, resources, financial resources, available now under EU, EU budgets, uh, public uh, finance, financial sources, private sources. Uh, the problem is the lack of uh, good projects because the, there is a huge and massive, um, massive resources to be, to be spent in, uh, in Poland for the transition. I had the pleasure to sum up this issue for Forum Energy Polish Think Tank. Uh, we have estimated that there is uh, around uh, 124 billion euro uh, to be spent for the next couple of years in Poland. And just to conclude, uh, for sure, the transition of the uh, Polish energy system uh, sector is, uh, needs to be towards net zero. This, is, this direction is irreversible. Uh, re irreversible um, uh, it needs to 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 go through uh, deployment of renewables and uh, strengthening energy efficiency decarbonization electrification sector coupling the same way as the other eu countries uh, are transforming the uh, energy sectors and eu legisla legislation uh, but also eu financial instruments are also are go going in the same direction and uh, create uh, through creating uh, the framework to accelerate and speed up the transition. Um, thanks to that, uh, this transition in the entire EU and in member states, uh, maybe in a relatively coherent way, which is absolutely something what uh, what what is. Uh, uh, important, bearing in mind the different starting points for the transition and uh, this state of play of, of, of Polish transition, which I uh, presented at the first part of my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, on, uh, I'm available. Feel free. Thank you very much, Pavel. Uh, Michel, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I will uh, present uh, some comments on uh, on Pavel's talk. Mm, uh, Pavel, thank you very much for your for your for your presentation. Uh, what I will what I will address is basically one aspect um, of this uh, comprehensive uh, picture that you that you painted. Um, basically. Uh, um, uh, basically, um, I th I, from from your talk, I I I think the the key 
challenges for Poland in terms of uh, the, the energy transition are, are threefold. Uh, first relates to the smog and air quality, uh, which, you, which you showed um, uh, on the map and changing the colors on, 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 on this map is a, is a major um, uh, exercise. Uh, the second challenge uh, and, and the, the, the part of the, the important part of the context is a high degree of import uh, in terms of uh, energy sources and then carbon intensity of the, of the power sector. Uh, and basically uh, what, what I think is, um, uh, is uh, distinguishes Poland uh, 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 in, in, context, in the context of other EU countries is the is the need for 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 a very rapid transition, uh, and any any rapid transition requires a lot of social support and social acceptance, which you mentioned also in your talk. Um, uh, and from from this point of view, uh, I just want to uh, say a few words about two uh, programs or two uh, uh, policy uh, uh, areas, uh, which I think are important and, and uh, which fit in quite nicely with with the sort this this issue of social acceptance. One is a clean air program, which addresses the problem of the smog, and um, and the other one is the issue of how to design uh, carbon taxes uh, and um, and how to do it in a way that uh, that en en ensures that uh, the most vulnerable households are are protected from from increasing uh, uh, prices. Uh, the clean air program um, is a major initiative uh, which basically aims at replacing of uh, re replacement of old uh, usually coal fueled uh, boilers and 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 aims at uh, supporting changes in in installation of households and of houses. It is a program um, which is designed uh, to reach about a third of uh, all households in Poland. Um, and also an initiative which shows how um, policy mistakes can slow things down and how uh, uh, improvements to the, to the policy design can then actually improve the rollout of the, of the, of the program. Um, the initial rollout was, was very unsuccessful and it was, um, well, I guess largely, uh, the lack of success was largely due to um, some political obstacles, I would say. Uh, finally, it was rolled out in May 2020, and uh, and um, uh, the uh, the degree of um, changes and support uh, has been has been growing, has been relatively fast. Basically, it uh, boils down to uh, means-tested subsidies uh, to uh, f facilitate adjustment uh, mm, uh, with, with respect to um, uh, energy production or, 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 or heating uh, in, in households. Mm, and it provides also tax credits for, for installation of households and changes in the, in the, um, in the structure of houses. Uh, so it's supposed to uh, to 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 reach uh, over four million households, and uh, uh, about tenth of those have already uh, applied for support, which is uh, which is uh, uh, well, perhaps still disappointing, but already uh, looking quite good. So it shows that the design of of the program and the the generosity of a program uh, uh, can uh, can uh, well uh, substantially influence its effectiveness. The second issue is uh, is the, the problem of uh, carbon taxation, and we've been working with the World Bank on uh, some analysis related to that, uh, with some simulations of uh, how uh, a carbon tax could be implemented and how um, how a, a, an initiative like this uh, could be uh, introduced uh, um, in, in in the economy. We simulated a carbon tax of 45 euros per ton of emissions, uh, which, uh, of course, you know, translates into higher prices and therefore a sort of tax burden on um, on households. But of course, at the same time, generates a lot of revenues. In this case, about 50 billion Polish wattage. Um, now, carbon taxation, when we uh, when we look at the whole process of um, of uh, production. Um, is is regressive 
and the burden is higher on the lower income uh, income house into into households budgets mm, and we show that it can be done in a way that uh, actually increases progressivity in in the Polish system and uh, um, supports uh, supports lower income households and it can be done in also in such a way that it is actually also positive from the point of view of employment so careful careful design again here will be crucial uh, so to sum up uh, and to to um, uh, uh, summarize uh, what you've said and and uh, somehow also relate perhaps to uh, to what uh, elena was saying earlier uh, I think bold decisions uh, will be uh, will be needed in Poland with, with respect to uh, the transition of the energy sector um, and uh, with respect to the improvements in air quality. Uh, I think uh, that apart from awareness of the society, uh, a key that there's a key role of political determination to well drive through these changes and increase uh, uh, increase awareness. Uh, but also, um, the, uh, of course, social support uh, achieved through different means is going to be uh, extremely important. And one of the means through which social support could be uh, could be secured um, is is careful policy design. And I think these two examples uh, which I mentioned um, are are. Uh, um, show that that this is this is important and this will be um this will be crucial uh for the uh, for the future success of these uh of the whole uh, transition thank you thank you very much michelle um so we're really out of time but i want to give pavel an opportunity to perhaps uh, react a little bit to the comments by michelle and i also wanted to raise one question from the audience that i got uh, so Ebba is asking, what will be the coal fuels? What will the coal fuels those be replaced with in this program? Is there a scrapping scheme for them to avoid them ending up in other households? So I guess there's a question yeah. to both of you. Well, if I may, it, it, yes, this is this is this is mainly aimed at replacing the coal uh, coal stoves. They will be replaced through different uh, different types of. Um, uh, energy uh, sources of boilers, gas, uh, oil, uh, and um, uh, and other types of more environmentally friendly uh, generators, uh, and there is a whole uh, you know process and program of of how to ensure that they are scrapped in a way that is also environmentally uh, friendly. How do you want to I add? Would, anything? I, yes, I would. I would like to add that. Legally, they cannot be installed. Uh, those those cold fueled uh, stoves cannot be installed once again legally. Uh, in my personal opinion, the problem with cleaner program is uh, that it promotes into, into much uh, natural gas boilers. Uh, bearing in mind the the high EU ETS prices and the second EU ETS, which will cover buildings, um, there is a risk of uh, of so-called gas locking. Uh, I would prefer rather to have uh, higher uh, higher support for for electrification of heating, uh, mainly through heat pumps, so that we can catch up and speed up the the process of transition of the uh, of the building sector in Poland. Okay, thank you very much. Any any other comments, Pavel, on, on Michel's uh, commentary? Or, I mean, I do agree. Uh, th th there are really very complex uh, uh, let's say approach we we both presented as the uh, as the transition of the Polish energy is uh, <laughs> is unique. I think. Most of countries of the EU, in all countries, is, is unique. But I believe that uh, due to the high reliance on coal and um, uh, as a, several uh, political discussions which we are facing, and several uh, let's say 
sensitiveness of this discussion in Poland, it's, it's, it makes our country uh, quite unique. So it's, it's, uh, that's why it's worth to discuss it in a broader context and uh, with the broader audience, not only in Poland. Yeah, I think you also did these different pieces of information clearly pinpoint the importance of reaching some more kind of political agreement between Poland and the European Union as well in order to release potential EU funding for you know the energy transformation in Poland and that that is to the benefit not only within Poland but also to the benefit of Europe, Europe and the world more generally I guess. Uh, but with that I just want to thank uh, Lena, Pavel and Michel for a very interesting discussion. And we are a little bit, um, of course, clever as we are. We have saved the last, saved the best for last. So I'm very happy to introduce to you Chloe Lecoq, who is professor of economics at University of Paris II, Pantheon Azas, and also a research fellow here at SITE. So Chloe will talk about energy security in Europe, and uh, you know the same procedure as last session. We will have time for some questions after her presentations. So please, Chloe, go ahead. Thank you, Anders, uh, for the invitation and the introduction and uh, be part of this development day. So it's a great pleasure to be able to talk about green transition and EU energy security issues. And this is a uh, joint work with uh, Elena Pasova. We've been working on energy security for 10 years, Elena, I just relaxed, so it's about time to summarize. Okay, great. Um, so, just to start, I think uh, we've been discussing the whole day about energy policy, environmental economics, but I think two key pillars of the European energy um, policy is, of course, the green transition, which is this idea to be climate neutral um, by uh, 2050. And then also, as uh, Roberto actually uh, mentioned it also, and Pavel extensively, uh, is this European Green Deal, right? So to boost the economy through uh, green technology, to create sustainable industry and transport and to cut pollution CO2. So that's the green transition. That's one of the objective um, of uh, within Europe, but also uh, within the world, right? But we have this European Green Deal. The other issue um, is this European, um, or this energy supply security, uh, which is, Indeed, the idea that um, you should make sure that you have continuous availability of energy at affordable prices, right? So to some extent, uh, you have three uh, sub objective when you're looking or try to ensure energy supply security, low energy price, safe energy and reliable energy supply. Okay, and I think, uh, the, the, the main discussion here is really whether we, by choosing green transition, we can improve energy security in the long run, right? Uh, there's been a lot of discussion under COVID uh, and so on. We can discuss it later on, but here our focus is really uh, only about the, the current and the future uh, role of natural gas uh, consumption within EU, given that we have this uh, two key pillar, green transition, energy uh, supply security. Okay, so uh, what does it mean, uh, green transition for demand for gas? Well, there is a first effect, uh, which is uh, from the green transition is definitely that we want more renewable sources of generation, biomass, wind, solar, and then uh, this will imply a more weather dependent and more volatile electricity supply. So indeed, depending on the scenario, but it is um, likely that we have a larger gas fire power plant capacity, or we will need a larger capacity for having a reliable power supply. So that's the first effect. The second effect um, is that in this Green Deal and all this talk about climate change, there's this idea that we're gonna electrify uh, economy, right? Not just the electric vehicle, but in general heating system also. And there's also this other tendency, even though it's it changing a little bit, that to phase out uh, coal, all fire power plant, 
And there's been some discussion about also close down nuclear generation plants around uh, Europe and across the world. Although, even though Germany did it, uh, it's less clear if Sweden or France will do it as well, right? But this electrification of the economy and this phasing out of coal, oil, fire, and even nuclear generation implies that at the end of the day, we will need more power demand. And uh, again, it is likely that we will have more gas in the generation mix because gas is considered as more environmentally friendly than coal. Okay, so clearly um, this is our understanding that if you go for green transition, at least in the mean term, uh, you will have to face a demand, an increased demand for gas. Um, and now let's talk about energy security then. Um, to some extent, you know, of course, this increased demand for gas um, may raise some concern regarding uh, the energy security within Europe, especially uh, because um, we have um, the current price of natural gas is about six times higher than last year, right? So this is what uh, it's shown in this figure. So this is just a spot uh, gas price. And uh, it is interesting to see that, you know, remember the energy security um, is also this idea to have affordable energy price. Clearly, if you go for an increased demand for gas, uh, you will have, you may face um, higher price. Of course, this is just one year back, right? So it was really low under the COVID period, but still this can happen. Um, so I think, you know, this increasing price is important because also not only you have gas price that is high, but given that about a fifth of Europe uh, electricity comes from natural gas, that means also that you have a pass through most likely, or you will have a pass through. So most likely as we see it and we're discussing, there's a lot of discussion that the electricity price will increase as well. So this is to some extent, uh, there's many reason uh, for this increase, but uh, nevertheless, it is uh, bad news for EU energy security if we, want to have affordable energy price. So that's the first point. Um, the second point is indeed when you look at this increased demand for gas, um, it is interesting to, to note that about 90% nowadays of EU uh, natural gas come from outside EU, right? It's been a decrease in domestic production. And moreover, as it is also often discussed, you know, Russia is the largest exporter of gas about so it's in 2020 it's 43 percent but it's it doesn't change so much across the year so again um if you are concerned about energy security and more specifically about the security of x what we call external gas supply then it might be uh, a problem that we have a large share of our gas in eu that is coming from outside and especially for one supplier namely Russia, right? So uh, we know that, you know, it could be that when you have external energy um, or external energy uh, supply, then that's mean that sometime it could be that the energy trade is driven by not only economic rational, but also what we could call political objective. Now, clearly uh, the, there is geolo geopolitical concern with the state control of uh, Gazprom, right? So um, to summarize to some extent, you know, this green transition allows or is more likely gonna uh, push for uh, increased demand for gas and most likely an increased demand for Russian gas. So um, what we did with Elena uh, on our work is try to understand what is the problem? What is the issue? when you uh, rely on supplier outside EU. So we have built uh, some index. Uh, one is the risky external energy supply index, where we measure the short-term impact of energy supply disruption. So uh, I'm not gonna go to detail. I have put reference in my slides, but I think what we do is that 
not only we control for importance of the energy type, which you will do for just like control, controlling or looking at energy input, but to, we also look at the access of different energy supplier. And what we find is that what you find is that this index vary across countries, but most importantly for this talk, that we find that the natural gas is riskier than the oil and gas. And the reason is that uh, we depend much more on single supplier or few supplier than oil, for example, that is a really a real liquid market. Uh, so that's maybe an issue that, you know, green resistance increased demand for gas. And then we find that indeed gas is risky in terms of supply disruption. Um, then we have also this idea that not only green transition will increase uh, demand for gas, but also will increase demand for Russian gas, right? And this obviously has raised some concern because, you know, uh, indeed uh, through pipeline, so you have about 77% of uh, gas and port that arrive uh, through pipeline. And obviously, um, given that, <laughs> Russia is the largest supplier, obviously, uh, you have also what we could call transit risk associated to this um, Russian gas, because this is the probability of gas supplies disruption, disruption right? So uh, this is really sensitive when you talk, we're talking about transport of Russian gas, because there has been some historical disputes across Ukraine, Belarus, and then recently Moldova. So this idea that it's not enough uh, to um, depend on Russia, but when you buy Russian gas, you're more likely to buy what we call pipeline gas and then go through all those pipeline. And then there is an additional risk, if you want, which we call the transit risk. However, um, this um, idea of additional transit risk um, is has to be taken with some grain of salt because indeed what we, ha we have seen uh, recently um, in these 10 years, but also when we have seen actually um, in the discussion is that people are thinking of diversification, diversifying the routes, right? So um, this was, uh, for example, the, the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, which was inaugurated in 2012. What was interesting is that it didn't really change uh, the, the issue between um, depending on Russian gas, it's just add one more extra energy route. And again, what we did with Elena in um, one of our paper is to try to assess um, the riskiness of pipeline gas import, but also to study the effect of introducing new gas routes. So we did it actually for the Nord Stream um, in a sense that we look at what is the impact of Nord Stream, and we're talking about Nord Stream Ryan, uh, 1 on uh, the impact of Nord Stream Dry, uh, 1 on the um, TRI, which is their, the risk exposure of different country. And what we find, maybe not so surprising, is like you have uh, with this Nord Stream 1, you have some winning country and some losing country. And what is interesting is that, of course, it depends how we uh, compose our index. And again, I'm not going to detail this uh, composition. You can have a look at our paper. But it, what is interesting is that you have winning country that are really sitting on the Nord Stream pipeline. And you, you have what we call the losing uh, country, which is that those country uh, that are uh, not sitting on Nord Stream per se, but, ha use, uh, but uh, are sharing other pipeline with those countries. So basically here you have the list. So not surprisingly, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, France, and Czech Republic, they had, they kind of can be considered as winning country, while uh, Poland, Italy, Slovenia, Austria, Hungary, and Slovakia, they are losing because they're losing some bargaining power also. So I think, um, yes, a new pipeline affect the transit risk exposure of country, uh, that are not connected to um, the, this new energy route, but we also find that 
yeah, you have clearly this diversification effect. So again, maybe at the end, increasing demand for Russian gas might not be an issue per se in terms of energy security because you just diversify. So I think that's really interesting trade-off here because what we say, and if I can summarize, you know, to some extent, uh, we know that green transition reduces carbon emission. And, uh, but here, it is um, likely that uh, it will also increase uh, gas demand, right? And uh, just to give you a, a, an idea of this increase, you know, um, we made some calculation with some other colleagues and uh, where we look at the effect of electrification of the transport and the heating. So the full electrification of the transport and the heating in France, Germany, and Netherlands. And what we find is that indeed, yes, uh, gas capacity should be around three to four times the current capacity by 2050. So that's the, so clearly, we know it reduce uh, carbon emission, but we also have an increase in gas demand. Then, of course, this increase uh, gas demand will will increase Russian gas ex import. Um, this is clear, um, or this is likely for at least some EU member state, right? So, and this will raise concern regarding EU energy security. Um, so. You know, you have uh, clearly uh, some trade off here between green transition and um, energy security. However, uh, I want to stress that the severity of this trade off obviously depends on the country's uh, specificity, right? So it will depend on the renewable energy policy, the energy mix. And here it's important to acknowledge that the initial condition, whether you have hydro or not, whether you have nuclear or not, uh, really matters in terms of the spread off. And then it will depend also how we assess social cost of green transition, right? So uh, Pavel, I think, uh, talk about energy poverty and energy concern, um, this energy uh, poverty concern. This is an issue also that will play around in this trade off that uh, so far hasn't, I haven't really been discussing. So it is a difficult trade off between green transition and uh, energy security. Uh, and the maybe next question, uh, since I cannot answer this one is to understand or stress how can the European Union uh, lose uh, this trade off, right? So obviously, one idea that we've been pushing uh, with Elena again uh, is that, you know, when you look at the common energy policy, um, the, the surprising, uh, uh, maybe one of, of the surprising uh, idea is that, you know, we talk about common energy policy, but when you look in, in fact, uh, you don't have a really real common decision. Right. It's um, given that energy um, is part of the national security, it is challenging to have one common energy policy, but it will be worth, uh, we believe that EU use as a uh, buyer power towards any supplier, including Russia, uh, to make sure that uh, even if um, EU wants to go to the green transition and want to increase um, is uh, natural gas import, uh, you will have uh, some, at least you will have a lower price and you will reduce the risk of energy uh, disruption. And indeed, I know uh, some people have been really worried about uh, what is going on in the gas market price. I just would like to remember that uh, so far, uh, Gazprom has met his obligation on their long-term agreement, which is uh, most of the gas is trade on the long-term agreement. So. But the, the, the big issue is that Gazprom has not uh, sold any additional gas on the EU spot market and uh, preferring to filling its domestic storage. It's just changed uh, now. Uh, we, we see some move now with the Gazprom, but I think I wanted to stress that um, so far the long-term agreement have have been uh, fulfilled. And that's an interesting part. And, and that show really that Gazprom also need this sell this gas. Um, 
The second point here is that we have now a reverse flows technology and it's been working for Ukraine. Ukraine is not importing any Russian gas anymore. And then so you can revert uh, the transmission and this gives a lot of freedom. So at the end of the day, uh, you know, even if you increase um, Russian gas import, uh, then maybe you, uh, Poland will import it from Germany and that's maybe not a big problem. Uh, there are also discussion and, and push for new energy routes. So again, if you think of the transit risk and then you think that, okay, if you want to diversify the energy um, um, route portfolio, then you should push for uh, TurkStream uh, pipeline that is now open in January 2020. You should go for the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. It's not clear when. And then uh, you should also think of you know, increasing the import from US via the existing natural gas um a terminal right so that's also another way to lose this trade off and um then uh and we've been doing some energy day on on some of those issues but it, clearly there is a investment in new technology so you know you want to as pavel was mentioning uh, develop uh, offshore winds uh, that's fine but you will also would like to have investment significant investment in storage capacity and and then finally, I think uh, it's important to see what's going on with the hydrogen. Right now, the blue hydrogen is, is not really liable, but um, it's quite costly. But nevertheless, uh, there is some new technology that Europe could invest in and try to, in order to make sure to have green transition and to ensure energy security. Thank you very much for your attention. And, uh, I, I put all the reference at the end of my talk. Uh, so if you want, you can have it later on. Thank you very much, Chloe. That was very interesting. And of course, a very timely topic that is discussed around Europe these days. So once again, I want to encourage people in the audience to use the Q&A function if you have questions and panelists to also ship in if you want to. You, don't, you can use the chat function or you can you know, just jump in directly. Uh, I see that uh, Michel is is jumping in, so I uh, I let him speak first. Yeah, so so uh, uh, thanks, Chloe. It was very very interesting. Uh, of course, uh, you know, in, in in Poland, the Nord Stream two uh, pipeline is is uh, very controversial, and the political discussion uh, about that um, keeps going, and um, uh, you know, various decisions uh, in one way or the other are hotly debated. I was just wondering if uh, if you did a similar exercise as you did for Nord Stream One, um, uh, for Nord Stream, Nord Stream Two, uh, would that be any different, or was is it just an increased capacity which would have similar consequences um, uh, across the the different groups of countries? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Yeah, uh, I provoke you as a Polish to say that Nord Stream is a good idea. Uh, no, we did not. So I, I don't want to say too much. Maybe Elena wants to jump in. Uh, and she has an idea, but we didn't do the calculation. Of course, uh, it depends how much you want to uh, use this Nord Stream to, uh, too. But in principle, it should be the same idea. No, you have one just extra route, and with the reverse flow, uh, you could you could have a more balance um, for, um you know you open you have one more option and to some extent so I, I don't see why it will change but maybe elena you want to jump in uh i didn't double check it but uh, yes you hear me great i didn't double check it but my current impression is the combination of uh, both north streams and turk stream would technically allow complete closure of ukrainian pipeline in terms of capacity, uh, which was not possible with only one line of Nord Stream. Okay. It's a different issue if this is going to uh, be of interest for either Russia or Europe. I don't think so. Okay. But from that perspective, I think it's a different, it's a slightly different game. Plus the reverse flow possibility that Chloe has mentioned, plus much more of a development of LNG, which may also kick in. So in principle, I think the same the same effects that we have been discussing for Nord Stream One would be there, but there will also be other effects. And and also, be, yeah, can I just add also because those calculations? So I've so I've seen this those, um, but I think it's important here that green transition is not taken 
taken into account when we do those calculations. So if you really electrify the whole economy, um, most likely you will you may need other pipeline. Huh? You may need still the Ukrainian pipeline. So is the key issue uh, a lot of new a lot of new internal uh, pipelines within the EU to allow this sort of reverse uh, uh, flows and essentially sharing of the of the gas between countries. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I don't know, Elena, you can interrupt me whenever you want. But I mean, so the, uh, the first idea of EU uh, buyer power and the fact that uh, you can behave and negotiate uh, with, for example, Gazprom as uh, one buyer, this will make even more sense if you have reverse flow. Mm. Because you could, uh, Germany could buy a lot and uh, ship in for uh, Poland, right? So that's this technology is. It's important, yeah. Yeah. So can I just add a question on nuclear energy as a sort of mm. alternative to gas as well, I guess. Uh, and yes. So for, for someone like me, it's, it's not entirely easy to understand the, the sizes of these different things. I mean, I know there are many commercial challenges in terms of new investments in nuclear energy, but in principle, if it was a political imperative, I guess there could be incentives to make those investments anyway. But uh, with the current uh, stock of nuclear production in Europe, and then, you know, given that, you know, maybe building something new may take a very long time, but, you know, making sure and maintaining that existing ones are, are staying on for a longer time period may be doable. Uh, but, but how big would the impact be in terms of energy production or, or something like that, do you think, relative to, say, connecting up with Nord Stream 2? Uh, in, in, in gas volumes. Do, do you have any sense of that? I mean, would it, even if we made, you know, substantial investment in, in maintaining the existing nuclear energy production, would it not quite be able to, to substitute for Nord Stream 2 or would it actually be, be more than that? Or, I, a tricky question, perhaps. Uh, yeah, no, so it depends on the number, right? So um, I, I will not talk about the new technology, the, the new, uh, the smaller uh, new, uh, our plant because I don't know exactly the efficiency, but let's talk just about the uh, the stock, so the old ones. So th definitely, there's a there's an issue why you should shut down those nuclear power plants right now. Um, there's a safety issue, obviously, but apparently, apparently, uh, you could do some small investment and then continue. It all is going to really depends on which type of nuclear power plant. So I think there's going to be a review uh, within Europe, and and you, you see that this is also not on, only in Europe. I mean, you see that um, uh, we saw this morning, right? That you uh, we have some there is some money for, uh, for example, France is giving money to nuclear uh, power plant. I think is Jan uh, on this right that was talking about this uh, this morning is that you want to make sure that everyone in Europe or in the world actually invests in safety. But if you have this, then you should really definitely um, maybe keep the, the nuclear for a while until we are we know more on the storage uh, capacity or storage technology. So that's my take, but it doesn't, I think Nord Stream is still, I mean, it's under construction, but it's soon there. And also why not having this extra option? I don't know, what do you think, Elena? Yeah, so, but I think nuclear, is, nuclear energy is back because we need it. So if you look at, like, for example, the work I've done uh, is really impressive, no? If you have to multiply by three or four your capacities, uh, your gas capacity, store, um, your gas capacity, that's a concern. Doesn't mean that France, for example, even if you double it or triple it, they don't consume that much. But nevertheless, think of Germany, that was a huge number. Uh, if I may have a comment, I think uh, on this on this nuclear, I mean, it, it is, uh, so for decarbonization, nuclear is definitely interesting option. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it can help a lot mixing. It might be actually, it is a short term, it can help the slow development of the renewables because it doesn't have really the characteristic of, of, of substituting gas. It is more a base load, right? So it is more like the, the renewables themselves with low cost of generation and, and not easy to adjust. To. So in reality, it will require less gas because you don't need the gas to compensate. I mean, nuclear doesn't fluctuate. 
but uh, and in the meantime, you might invest in storage. So yeah, it might be a good intermediate solution. Probably I tend to agree with that. Yeah, I mean that's my impression. Uh, yeah, so so you're right, of course, Roberto. This is a uh, nuclear is not done to do backup technology. No, it's not the backup technology in the sense that you cannot go up and run. <laughs> a nuclear power plant and shut it down when you, there's a wind and then stop it. Um, but you know, uh, some people are, so they're improving technology and that's why there's this small nuclear power plant, but we think they could play a role and have um, kind of the role of the backup technology. But I agree with you, it's it's just base load uh, energy. So we should be careful not to use them as backup technology up and down because this also creates stress on the, um, on the nuclear uh, group, right? On the nuclear uh, power plant. Any final comment from the panel on this topic of energy security? If not, I will declare this particular session over then, which, uh, or maybe Norberto, did you raise your hand? Oh, it was a, a mistake. I was moving one thing and I touched the hand. It's fine. <laughs> okay, here we go. Well, then I, I close this particular session, and which also means actually that we are closing sort of this year's site development day conference more generally. Uh, so I hope that you in the audience and you panelists have enjoyed this as much as I have done and learned as much as I have done. Uh, and I would argue then that if you have an interest in Eastern Europe more generally, and in particular, if you have an interest in environmental policy in the region, uh, then make sure to follow what is happening here at site in the future, because we will do more of these types of events. We have always done and will continue to do events with respect to so Eastern Europe, but we will also do more and more with a particular focus on, on energy and the environment as well. Hopefully in the near future, it will be possible to even hold these kind of events in person so we get a chance to sort of interact and, and you know, uh, treat you to some good uh, coffee and buns and lunch and all these nice things that comes with that and human interaction, not least. But uh, for now on, I guess we have to do with this. Uh, we will post a summary of today's event on our web page, just so you know, and our panelists have also generously given us the sort of permission to post their presentations as well. So make sure to check in. It may take a week or two, but uh, definitely we will have it up on the web page uh, in a little while. Uh, and I also, of course, want to take this opportunity to thank all of your presenters participated in today's event and making this a very successful and informative event as well. And of course, also thank you to you and your audience for listening in. Uh, and also, you know, yes, a general thanks to all of our stakeholders and partners in the public and the private sector that makes it possible for us here at site and within the free network to, you know, do this kind of analysis and organize this kind of public events as well. Uh, but with that, bye bye everybody, bye bye all panelists, bye bye everybody in the audience. Uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, I guess, if I don't see you. Bye bye from us at site. Thank you. Agendas. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.